Uh, the Subcommittee on Health will now come to order. Good morning, everyone. We have uh, a lot of work to do today, so uh, I'm going to d don't uh, try to test my uh, generosity so that we can move along and, and get uh, uh, all of our work done. Welcome to the witnesses. Uh, I just wanted to um, uh, uh, mention something. We have a roundtable tomorrow uh, with the appropriate agencies relative to the coronavirus uh, for our committee. Uh, today, uh, there's a, a briefing for the full House. So it's up to members if you want to leave to go to the full one. I'm going to stay here so that we can uh, get our work done. And um, uh, so you have a choice. Uh, you can do both. Um, but I'm not going to stop the hearing to go to the, uh, uh, to the full briefing so that we can... Uh, uh, get our work done. Uh, I'd like to uh, also welcome uh, our colleague, former colleague, Bart Stupak, who's here, uh, always a friend, uh, wonderful member of this committee for many years. Bart, welcome. It's great to see you. Uh, the chair now recognizes herself for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, 20 cents out of every dollar uh, spent by American consumers uh, goes toward food or medicine that's regulated by the FDA. Today, we're going to examine uh, 10 mostly bipartisan bills uh, to support the FDA's immense mission. Uh, our first uh, panel will consider four bills uh, to grant the FDA new authorities to tackle challenges that threaten our drug supply. Chairman Pallone's legislation to create national centers of excellence uh, to support research and development of continuous manufacturing technology will strengthen and modernize U.S. drug production. The Safeguarding Therapeutics Act, introduced by Representative Brett Guthrie, will protect against counterfeit medical devices. Uh, Representative Doris Matsui's Modern Labeling Act will make sure generic drugs have up-to-date uh, safety labeling, uh, labeling. Finally, the Orphan Drug Exclusivity Act introduced by Representative Madeline Dean will close a loophole uh, so that orphan drugs exclus uh, exclusivity can't be used to deny access to certain drugs, especially drugs for opioid use dis uh, disorder. Taken together, these bills improve the drug supply chain from the very beginning to the very end. Uh, so that patients have access to quality products that are genuine and uh, accurately labeled. On the second panel, we're going to consider six bills that affect the FDA's oversight of food products. Many of these bills take action on decisions that the FDA has long delayed. For example, the FASTER Act, introduced by Representative Doris Matsui, Matsui lives up to its name. The act makes the FDA move faster in requiring food manufacturers to list sesame as an allergen on their products. The bill also allows the FDA uh, to add other food ingredients as major allergens based on the prevalence and severity of allergic reactions. Over a year ago, the FDA issued a request for information about requiring the sesame allergen label, but has not taken any steps since. This allergen labeling is very important, especially for children, obviously, and their families. An estimated 8% of American children are affected by food allergies, and the NIH recently found that uh, sesame allergy is common among children with other food allergies, occurring about 17% of the time. But those parents and children uh, cannot easily avoid sesame since it's not listed as an ingredient. Anyone who's ever known a child with a serious food allergy uh, knows how dire a reaction can be. The FDA needs to move faster to help curb the risks uh, these children face, and the FASTER Act will help the FDA do just that. The Keep Food Containers Safe from uh, PFAS Act, introduced by Congresswoman Dingell, forces the FDA to confront the issue of PFAS chemical contamination in food wrappers and containers. Uh, the, uh, the chemicals have been found to easily accumulate in the environment or the human body because they break down very slowly. Exposure to PFAS can lead to cancer, weaker immune systems, and liver and kidney toxicity. The FDA has said that PFAS approved for use on paper or cardboard uh, to prevent grease stains can potentially migrate to food. 
Recent studies have found that eating microwave popcorns and meals, warning members, it's in both of our cloakrooms. Uh, <laughs> Uh, recent studies have found that eating microwave popcorns and meals from fast food and pizza restaurants was associated with higher levels of PFAS in blood, but the FDA has not yet limited uh, PFAS in food packaging. Instead, the FDA says that because of the growing scientific evidence, it will review whether the use of PFAS in food contact applications is safe. I hope the agency takes more definitive action soon. The panel will also... Uh, consider bills to address unanswered questions around the FDA's regulation of dairy and cheese products, exportation of horse meat, and infant formula. In total, the FDA oversees more than $2.6 trillion in consumption of food, medical products, and tobacco. I hope today's hearing will help the agency better shoulder its massive responsibility, and we certainly want to work with the agency to make sure that all of this happens. Uh, the chair is now pleased to recognize the ranking member uh, of the Subcommittee on Health, Dr. Burgess, uh, for five minutes for his opening statement. And I thank the chair and welcome to our witnesses. Welcome to the witnesses of both panels, in fact, because we do have a, a great deal in front of us this morning. The Food and Drug Administration is the oldest comprehensive consumer protection agency within the federal government. Dating back to 1906, the FDA has been the administrative body tasked with protecting Americans from adulterated and misbranded drugs and food. Since 1906, the authority of the Food and Drug Administration and its responsibilities have grown to include cosmetics, tobacco, and other public health programs. Today, we are considering a number of drug and device policies. Representative Guthrie's bill, H.R. 5663, the Safeguarding Therapeutics Act, allows for the Secretary of Health and Human Services to destroy certain counterfeit medical devices. Counterfeit devices do pose a risk to Americans. I actually saw this firsthand when I visited the JFK International Mail Facility with former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb. To say the least, it was unsettling to realize these device, counterfeit devices could not be destroyed but returned to sender, and many of those recycled back through several times with the same markings on the package. They need to be destroyed when they're, when they're encountered. Uh, counterfeit facilities that come through uh, the facilities like the JFK, and this bill would allow for such devices to be destroyed at the point of entry. Granting authority to the secretary to ensure that the devices will be destroyed will help protect patients from bad actors who distribute these counterfeit devices into the marketplace. H.R. 4712, the Fairness in Orphan Drug Exclusivity Act, seems to seeks to clarify conditions for exclusive approval and licensure of drugs that receive orphan drug designation under the non-profitability provision of the Orphan Drug Act. The government has an important role with respect to orphan drugs. Without government assistance, the manufacturers and the innovators for drugs and rare diseases may never be able to bring these products to market. This legislation appropriately balances the support necessary to promote orphan drug development without allowing for orphan drug manufacturers to inhibit competition. It is important we walk that fine line between competition and encouraging new cures. Another bill aimed at innovation is 4866. This would designate certain qualifying higher educational institutions as national centers of excellence in continuous pharmaceutical managing, ma manufacturing to support the advancement and development of continuous manufacturing. Continuous manufacturing has many benefits, uh, allowing for more flexible tracking and tracing in the event of a product failure, and it can eliminate hold times between steps of production, important technology, because the ability to track and trace during a product failure could minimize the risk of a drug shortage, and we've been through that in years past. Certainly over my time on this subcommittee, the subcommittee has held hearings on, under the food jurisdiction of the Food and Drug Administration, and recognizing uh, former Chairman Stupak in the back of the room, I think some of those hearings were conducted under you and, and Chairman Dingell, which I remember very fondly. The Food and Drug Administration is the authoritative Agency on Labeling and Nutrition, Ingredients and Packaging. It is important for Americans to be aware of what is in their food from the nutritional value to what additives or allergens may be present. 
HR 2269, the Infant Formula Protection Act of 2019, would require infant formula to be considered adulterated by the FDA if it passes the use-by date. It seems a little unusual to me, but I'm happy to hear what the, what the evidence shows. Some other bills before us today are dealing with food requirements that overstep the authority of the Food and Drug Administration. They are the expert body on food regulation and safety. Well intentioned legislation may result in unforeseen negative consequences, particularly where the FDA has not found a need for regulation in the past. And unfortunately, we don't have the FDA here as a witness today. At some point, we will need to invite them in. But I do want to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Guthrie to speak on his bill. Uh, thank you to the Republican leader for yielding. I was proud to introduce three bipartisan bills today. Uh, the Modern Labeling Act will uh, modify how certain generic drug labels are updated. The Safeguarding Therapeutics Act will protect American consumers from counter counterfeit medical devices. Like uh, my friend Dr. Burgess, I was floored when I was at JFK Airport and realized that we just return uh, counterfeit devices by law. We can't destroy them, so we'll fix, hopefully fix that this session. And then the Continuous Manufacturing Bill will expand our work on 21st century cures uh, to increase research and development on continuous manufacturing. I'd like to thank Representative Matsui, Matsui, Representative Engel, and Chairman Plone for working with me on these bills. And I yield back. Yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I was going to recognize Mr. Plone, uh, but I will instead rep recognize the gentlewoman from Michigan, uh, Ms. Dingle, in, uh, in his place. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Ranking Member Burgess for convening this hearing and including important public health legislation, including my bill, the Keep Food Containers Safe from PFAS Act. I'm appreciative of the inclusion of a witness from my district, Dr. Kwa Ping Chua, who is a professor at pediatrics at the University of Michigan Medical School. His background and expertise will help the committee better understand the intersection of opioid policy and orphan drug policy, and we are grateful to have him with us today. We look forward to learning more about these important issues as we work to ensure that Americans have access to these potentially life-saving drugs. We thank Dr. Chua for his time and pioneering work in this area and the opportunity to learn from his expertise. I'd also like to express my appreciation again for the committee's wisdom in inviting a professor from the greatest public university in the world. Go blue. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. Pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, our friend Mr. Walden, for his five minutes for an opening statement. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thanks for having this hearing. Welcome to our witnesses and guests. Uh, as we've heard, we'll have an opportunity to review legislation that's intended to improve uh, the safety of medical products in the United States. We'll also review several food-related policies. I briefly want to extend a special thanks and welcome to uh, Dr. Doug Corey from Oregon's 2nd Congressional District uh, for being here today. Well, it may seem uh, a little tamer here in Congress than what he's used to seeing at the Pendleton Roundup back home. I, I can assure you we have our fair share of excitement, among other things that might resemble what happens at rodeos uh, here at the hearings. I appreciate Dr. Corey taking his time to testify and know his valued expertise will bring an important perspective to our discussions uh, about animals. I'm pleased we will be uh, considering four bipartisan priorities on the first panel that aim to improve the safety of America's uh, drug supply, bring more transparency to the marketplace, and provide additional protections against the threat of counterfeit products. H.R. 5663, the Safeguarding Therapeutics Act, would extend FDA's administrative des destruction authority to medical devices. That only makes sense. As you've heard, under current law, the FDA is authorized to destroy certain imported drugs that may pose a threat to public health. However, this authority does not extend to medical devices, including some combination uh, in combination products. This legislation, uh, introduced by Mr. Guthrie and Mr. Engel, would provide the agency with the additional tool to protect American consumers against potentially dangerous unapproved products. Furthering our efforts to protect the country's medical product supply chain, we'll also be considering H.R. 4866, which is the National Centers of Excellence in Continuous Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Act. H.R. 4866, introduced by Chairman Pallone, would direct the FDA to designate higher education institutions as national centers of excellence, allowing the FDA to work with the centers and industry to create a national framework for the implementation of continuous manufacturing technology. At our October hearing on safeguarding the pharmaceutical supply chain, Dr. Woodcock 
spoke at length about the potential advantages of continuous uh, manufacturing, including the potential to reduce our dependence on foreign sources of active pharmaceutical ingredients, increase our manufacturing resiliency, and reduce quality issues that often trigger drug shortages. Given the potential for this technology, I'm pleased we're considering this bipartisan legislation uh, to further advance its development. We'll also be considering H.R. 5668, that's the Modern Labeling Act, which will allow the FDA to require modifications be made to outdated labeling for generic drugs. Generic drugs are generally required to have the same labeling as the brand drug they reference. However, once the brand drug is no longer on the market, the generic manufacturer is not able to update their label to reflect the most accurate and up-to-date information, often discovered through post-market use. So the inability to update labeling can result in information gaps for providers and patients when discussing the most appropriate treatments. H.R. 5668 will help close those gaps. That's important. Additionally, we'll consider H.R. 4712, the Fairness and Orphan Drug Exclusivity Act. This legislation will update the Orphan Drug Act to require drug manufacturers that receive an orphan drug designation under the post-recovery provision of the Act to demonstrate that successor drugs eligible for the designation do not have a reasonable expectation of recouping their research and development costs. H.R. 4712 aims to balance the need to maintain existing incentives for orphan drug development while eliminating loopholes that may allow a drug manufacturer to actually block competition. So I appreciate uh, the majority's attention to these bipartisan proposals and hope they'll continue to work with us on bipartisan legislation, particularly initiatives focused on the reauthorization of critical programs set to expire at the end of the year. One of those programs is that rare pediatric uh, priority review voucher program, Madam Chair, I know you're familiar with. Several members of this committee already have worked together in a bipartisan manner to introduce the Creating Hope Reauthorization Act, which would extend this program. And I, I would ask the Chairwoman to uh, consider its inclusion in a future hearing. Finally, we'll be considering several legislative initiatives intended to address FDA's regulation of foods. And I've heard concerns from dairy and beef producers in my district related to standards of identity. And I welcome the discussion of these matters today as well. However, I also have some concerns with some of the bills being considered today may actually have unintended and negative consequences and, and ignore the science-based approach FDA takes when regulating products under their jurisdiction. So with that, um, I, I welcome our witnesses and our guests and appreciate the hearing. Uh, just as a footnote, as you know, we have another hearing uh, scheduled to start in about 15 minutes downstairs, so I'll be bouncing back and forth, as will the chairman, I'm sure. With that, I'll yield back all 22 seconds. We know that you bounce well. Uh, the, uh, the chairman um, yields back. Uh, and is, I think that's it, right? All right, uh, the chair would like to remind members that uh, pursuant to committee rules, all members' uh, written opening statements uh, will be made part of the record. I now uh, have the pleasure of introducing our witnesses uh, of the first panel. Uh, first, Dr. Uh, Chiwa uh, Peng, uh, Dr. Kao Peng Chiwa, excuse me, uh, assistant professor at the Department of Pediatrics, as uh, Congresswoman uh, Dingle said, uh, for the University of Michigan Medical School. Welcome to you. Uh, Dr. Fernando Muzio, distinguished professor, chemical and bi biochemical engineering at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Special welcome to you as well. Uh, Mr. Richard Kaiser, vice president, global brand protection, Johnson & Johnson. You're the only doc the only one that's not a doctor. Time to go back to school. Uh, Dr. Jeff Allen, President and CEO of the uh, Friends of Cancer Research. Welcome to you. Uh, uh, we look forward to your important testimony. I think you're uh, familiar with the light, green, you go. Uh, yellow, watch out. Red, full stop, okay? Uh, so, uh, Dr. Chua, you are now recognized for five minutes for your testimony, and thank you again. Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Burgess, Congresswoman Dingell, Congressman Upton, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. I'm a practicing general pediatrician and health policy researcher with expertise in opioid policy and orphan drug policy. These two areas of my research unexpectedly converged when Sublocade, a once monthly buprenorphine injection, was approved as an orphan drug to treat opioid use disorder 
also known as opioid addiction. This approval entitled Sublocade to a seven-year period of exclusivity during which no new buprenorphine products could be marketed for opioid use disorder. Although FDA recently revoked Sublocade's orphan approval, it could still receive exclusivity if, the, if this decision is overturned in court. Today, I will explain why I strongly support passing HR 4712, the Fairness and Orphan Drug Exclusivity Act. This bill will close the loophole that allowed Sublocade's orphan approval and block exclusivity for Sublocade even if FDA's decision is overturned, thus promoting public health by ensuring competition, innovation, and patient choice in the market for buprenorphine. Over the past decade, opioid overdose has claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of Americans, including the parents and siblings of some of my patients. To prevent these deaths, federal policymakers must ensure that patients have access to safe and effective medications to treat opioid use disorder, including buprenorphine. However, FDA nearly achieved the complete opposite goal when it granted orphan approval to Sublocade, potentially allowing its manufacturer, Indivior, to stifle competition and innovation for seven years. In addition, Sublocade's orphan approval was an abuse of orphan drug policy. This approval occurred under a 23-year-old orphan drug designation granted in 90, 1994 to Subutex, a predecessor buprenorphine product developed by Indivior's parent company, Reckitt Benckiser. To obtain this, designa this designation, Reckitt Benckiser used the Orphan Drug Act's cost recovery prong, which requires companies to demonstrate that a drug's U.S. sales will be insufficient to recover development and marketing costs. As it turns out, Reckitt Benckiser's cost recovery analysis in 1994 was faulty. Moreover, Subutex had $285 million in sales between 2002 and 2011. Despite both of these facts, FDA automatically grandfathered Subutex's orphan designation to Sublocade when it was approved in November 2017 without requiring Indivior to submit another cost recovery analysis showing that Sublocade would be unprofitable. In April 2019, one of Indivior's competitors filed a citizen petition asking FDA to revoke Sublocade's orphan drug designation and refuse to grant exclusivity. In November 2019, FDA ruled in favor of the, pet of the petition and denied Sublocade exclusivity. For now, this means that competing buprenorphine products can enter the market starting December 2020. While FDA's decision is a step in the right direction, it could be overturned if Indivior decides to sue. This possibility is one of the reasons it is so important to pass HR 4712. If, even if FDA's decision is overturned, the bill would prevent exclusivity for Sublocade unless Indivior submitted a cost recovery analysis showing that it did not expect Sublocade to be profitable when it was improved in November 2017. However, such an, an analysis would be impossible to construct because Indivior itself has projected that Sublocade will reach $1 billion in peak annual sales. HR 4712, would also require drug companies to submit cost recovery analyses for any future orphan approval under a cost recovery prong designation, thus closing the loophole that allowed Sublocade's orphan approval. One advantage of HR 4712 is that its scope is limited. It would only affect orphan approvals under cost recovery prong designations, and there have only been three such designations since 1983. This limited scope does not negate its importance as it will permanently block Sublocade from receiving exclusivity that would impede patients' access to life-saving buprenorphine products. In my view, passing HR 4712 is a common sense step that will be good for orphan drug policy, good for public health, and good for the millions of Americans with opioid use disorder. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. Thank you, Doctor. Um, it's important to note that the two companies that you're mentioning, uh, they, uh, they're really not two companies. It was in the original name and then the name was changed. So this is not a dispute between two companies. Okay. Dr. Muzio, welcome. We're very happy to see you. We appreciate your being here and you have five minutes for your testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman Ishu, Ranking Member Burgess, members of the subcommittee, my name is Fernando Musio. I am a distinguished professor of chemical and biochemical engineering at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. I am also the director of CSOPS, an NSF engineering research center 
that has been devoted to continuous manufacturing research for the past 15 years. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to appear in this hearing on improving the safety of pharmaceutical manufacturing in the US and to express my strong support for HR 4866, which I believe is essential to maintain the viability of pharmaceutical manufacturing in the US. I want to thank Chairman Pallon for introducing this bill and for his leadership in this issue. Now, the traditional approach to pharmaceutical manufacturing is called batch manufacturing, and this approach is slow, it's very difficult to optimize, and it actually provides limited ability to assure product quality. Working in our center, we have developed a far superior technology continuous manufacturing. As defined in HR 4866, in continuous manufacturing, you load ingredients at a control rate into the process, and then you operate the process in a state of control every minute of every hour so that you can assure the quality of the product that you are making consistently. This minimizes quality failures, but it does much more than that. So in the last 14 years in our center, we established a full ecosystem with multiple universities, FDA, NSF, more than 60 companies, and the USP. And in this center, we built and demonstrated the first continuous manufacturing line to operate in a full state of control. And then working in close partnership with Johnson & Johnson, we also enabled the implementation of the first continuous manufacturing system that was approved by FDA for transition from batch manufacturing to continuous manufacturing for the drug Presista. Since then, there has been six products approved by the Food and Drug Administration. There are many more in the pipeline, and this has become a worldwide phenomenon where every major co country in the world is pursuing implementation of continuous manufacturing. The main point of my testimony is that this presents a major opportunity for the US to bring back manufacturing to the country. The reason is that batch manufacturing requires cheap labor, and that's one reason we've lost so much of it. Continuous manufacturing requires access to know-how. And right now, the US has the largest concentration of know-how on how to implement continuous manufacturing systems. So in the next few years, you will witness a transition from batch to continuous manufacturing of a large segment of the pharmaceutical industry. The question is, where will this happen? This transition provides a big opportunity for the US. It has many benefits. It could lower drug prices, it could help create many high paying jobs. It would reduce our dependence on imports and it would lead to faster product and process development, which is important because it will give patients faster access to cures and it will also enable a faster response to emergencies and shortages. Now there is a threat. The threat is that Europe is on the march. They have already funded several centers in this area. And also Europe has most of the companies that produce equipment for continuous manufacturing. But we have the know-how. So if we articulate a meaningful US-based response, we could actually capture much of this conversion from batch to continuous and use it to regrow pharmaceutical manufacturing in this country. A suitable US response is for a, a HR4866 because it provides the resources to create the partnership between academia, government, universities, industry, and the USP, and to make the knowledge available to all sectors of the pharmaceutical industry and to other industries that use similar manufacturing methods. Universities are essential in this endeavor because universities provide the long-term research perspective and the research strength to create and demonstrate new technology and to train the large number of people that are needed to implement these systems. So with that, I thank you once again for inviting me to be here. I would request to please incorporate my full written testimony into the record, and I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Muzio. Uh, everything that you said is music to my ears, and of course your full testimony will be uh, made part of the uh, committee's uh, record. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize Mr. Richard uh, uh, Kayser, the Vice President of Global Brand Protection, uh, Protection at Johnson & Johnson. You're recognized for your five minutes of testimony. Thank you very much.
Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Burgess, and members of the committee, good morning. And thank you for the opportunity to discuss how we can strengthen patient safety by granting the Food and Drug Administration the same authority for dealing with certain counterfeit devices as it has for drugs that have been refused admission into the United States. My name is Rich Kayser, and I'm Vice President of Global Brand Protection at Johnson & Johnson and responsible for combating illicit trade, including counterfeiting, illegal diversion, and tampering across all Johnson & Johnson business segments, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and personal health care. Illicit trade has increased dramatically in recent years, impacting nearly every industry. According to one estimate, global trade in counterfeit goods will hit $1.9 trillion by 2023. The problem is obviously a serious concern in the health care and personal care industries where patients and consumers can be injured or even die due to unsafe counterfeit and illicit products. In fact, counterfeit drugs are the biggest market estimated at $200 billion per year. Given that figure, it's no surprise but shocking nonetheless that Interpol estimates that one million people will die each year from taking counterfeit medicines globally. At Johnson & Johnson, we believe our first responsibility is to the patients, to the mothers and fathers, to the doctors and nurses, and all those who use our products and services. They must have unequivocal confidence in the quality, safety, and authenticity of Johnson & Johnson products. Thus, we have a strong enterprise-wide anti-counterfeiting and brand protection strategy in place to proactively and aggressively manage risks related to illicit trade, and most importantly, to protect patients and consumers from potential harm. Our global brand protection team, which I lead, is responsible for these efforts across the company. While my team is 100% dedicated to this mission, Effective brand protection also requires significant teamwork across our entire business, as well as extensive collaboration between industry partners, academia, law enforcement, and government agencies. Lawmakers play a critical role in strengthening our laws to increase penalties and reduce incentives for illegal trade. We appreciate the leadership in, uh, the rep of Representatives Guthrie and Engel on this issue. As such, Johnson & Johnson is very pleased to support H.R. 5663, the Safeguarding Therapeutics Act, which extends FDA authority to destroy counterfeit drugs and devices and combination products valued at $2,500 or less. We believe this authority is important to protect the integrity of the supply chain by preventing counterfeit products from reaching consumers and patients. A recent example of counterfeiting that has impacted our medical device business involves a product known as Surgicel, a blood clot inducing material that is used to control bleeding during and after surgery. We learned that counterfeit products labeled and sold as Surgicel were entering the supply chain in the United States and other markets through unauthorized gray market distributors. A timely investigation identified and shut down an international counterfeiting scheme. We engaged our customers to notify them about the counterfeit issue and, and explain that buying our products only from authorized distributors is vital to protect patients and providers. Importantly, we also involved the FDA, and we're cooperating closely with our criminal investigation teams as they consider taking enforcement action against the parties involved. I'm happy to discuss this case in more detail. While cases like this put illicit traders on notice and have a deterrent effect, unfortunately, in today's global uh, marketplace, we are likely to continue to see illicit medical devices, drugs, and personal care products entering legitimate supply chains. Healthcare products will continue to be one of the most commonly targeted industry for counterfeiters. Counterfeit products and illicit trade present a growing risk to patients and consumers. We have an opportunity to make our world safer by ensuring the FDA has the authority needed to destroy counterfeit drugs, devices, and combination products. Together, we can work to protect patients and consumers from the threat of counterfeit health and personal care products. Thank you for your time and attention today to this critically important issue, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaiser. Uh, Dr. Allen, welcome and thank you again. Uh, you, you are recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, and good morning, Chair, Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Burgess, and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Jeff Allen, President and CEO of Friends of Cancer Research, a research and advocacy organization dedicated to accelerating science from bench to bedside. It's an honor to testify before you today and provide our perspective on regarding prescription drug labels. When kept up to date, labeling represents the most authoritative drug-related information that is available to prescribers. However, labeling can become outdated when high-quality scientific evidence 
is generated in the post-market setting, but the drug's manufacturer does not file a supplemental application requesting a modified use be added to the drug's label. Manufacturers have an ongoing responsibility to report signals of serious risk to the FDA, and the agency has the authority to order changes relating to new safety information. However, there's no requirement or authority to update product labeling with new or modified uses, though manufacturers may choose to do so voluntarily when they wish to market their products in new settings. Given the pace of research and treatment advances in the field of oncology, off-label use is common and important. To examine the extent to which labels keep pace over time, we evaluated the difference between medically recommended uses of a drug included in leading clinical guidelines and compared that to the uses contained in the label. Our study examined cancer drugs approved over a 12-year period. For almost every drug that we looked at, 79% to be exact, the clinical guidelines had more recommended uses than those described in the FDA label. Of the 450 recommended uses associated with all the drugs included in the study, 253 were not listed on FDA-approved labels. Of these off-label uses, 91% were graded as being based on strong existing evidence and backed by the uniform consensus of the guideline advisory committees, meaning that up to 80% of these drugs have additional uses supported by high-quality evidence missing from their labels. When sections of the FDA-approved labeling become outdated, they may lose value for prescribers and fail to communicate essential information about drugs to patients and healthcare providers. A particularly stark example is the drug oxaliplatin, which was approved in 2004 for two forms of colon cancer. Since then, it's been further tested and recommended in clinical guidelines for 10 additional disease settings, none of which are in the product label. While many expert oncologists have access to information and experience with the use of oxaliplatin, there are many that still rely on the drug label in making treatment decisions. This may be most important to a general oncologist in a busy practice or a community setting. The whole premise of generic drugs is that they are materially indistinguishable from their brand name counterparts. And as such, under current law, a generic is required to have the same label as its branded reference product. But over time, some original manufacturers of the older drugs will voluntarily withdraw their products from the market for reasons other than safety and efficacy, leaving only generic manufactured products on the market. This situation is often referred to as a withdrawn reference listed drug or a withdrawn RLD. And here's the problem. In these cases, the labels of the remaining generic drugs are still required to match their original reference product even though it's been withdrawn. And even as data may continue to evolve, these labels essentially become frozen in time and are unable to be updated. In collaboration with the numerous stakeholders, members of this committee have developed the Modern Labeling Act to address the prevalence of out outdated labels in cases where there is a withdrawn RLD. The legislation addresses this problem by establishing a process for updating labels to reflect new information relevant to the drug and its optimal use. Restoring the re relevance of approved labeling is an important public health goal. While other high quality sources of prescribing information play an important role in clinical care, labeling is the sole source of information that reflects the scientific and methodological rigor of the FDA approval process. Patients and prescribers can have the assurance that the use of medicines in conformity with the drug labeling is supported by a positive benefit risk assessment. The Modern Labeling Act would aid in maintaining up-to-date drug labels for certain generic drugs and restore the relevance of the label and foster greater trust in medical products for physicians and patients. I again thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important topic and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. Uh, we've now concluded uh, uh, the opening statements of our witnesses. Uh, for our first panel, and we'll now move to member questions, and I'm going to recognize myself uh, for five minutes uh, to do so. Uh, first, I want to go to Dr. Muzio. Um, uh, I said uh, on the heels of your testimony that what you said was music to my ears. Uh, I spent a, a good part of last year uh, researching, studying the whole issue of API, um, uh, the, uh, the the status of uh, drug manufacturing in the United States, um, uh, being dependent upon a foreign country uh, that has the, 
the API, the core ingredients uh, for drugs, and found it chilling. Uh, this subcommittee had an extensive hearing uh, on the subject, and FDA did testify on uh, uh, the importance and the um, uh, really looking to the future relative to continuous manufacturing. Now, I'm thrilled to hear about what you're doing. Um, you almost make it sound simple. <laughs> Uh, that, um, you know, that we have the silver bullet. Um, can you tell me, um, or describe the status of where we are with continuous manufacturing now? Is it still nascent and being researched? Uh, how many companies are using it in the United States? Uh, what would the average cost be for establishing uh, a, a continuous manufacturing system um, uh, in our country because, uh, as you said, uh, I, I think most of it has gone overseas, namely to China and to India. That's where generic drugs are made. In fact, my chief of staff showed me a pres her prescription bottle and she decided to, given the subject matter, because I talk about it all the time with my staff, she peeled back her label with her name on it and the date and all of that and um, it was, uh, came from India. So can you answer those questions for me? I can try. Thank you very much okay. for those questions. Mm -hmm. So we have to distinguish the making of the drug substance, the API, from the making of the finished product. I understand that. Yes. I understand that. Both can be greatly improved by continuous manufacturing methods. Um, the current status is that for finished products, for solid dose products, tablets and capsules, the technology is now robust. It has been implemented at about, I would say, 10 to 15 brand-based companies. Um, and so if we want to extend it and really have a major impact, the key issue is to make sure that the know-how required to implement this technology becomes available to the other sectors of the industry, the generics, the over-the-counter manufacturers, etc. The brand-based companies have the know-how in-house. Mm -hmm. um, we also critically should create places where companies can come and get the help they need in demonstrating the technology for their products and in facilitating the manufacture of clinical supplies without having to spend 15 or $20 million to first get a system implemented. That is a very high entry cost for smaller pharma, generic pharma. So let me ask you this. Yes. Given the work that you're doing and what this bill promotes, uh, does it shorten the time frame around um, actual uh, continuous manufacturing for, uh, for the pharmaceutical industry in the United States? Yes, for finished products, it definitely And what kind would. of time frame is that? Well, I believe that we could create the environment that would help the rest of the industry in just a few months, because uh -huh. we already have systems implemented and the know-how. What we need now is to facilitate access to put in place the mechanisms for the rest of the industry to be able to access the know-how effectively and quickly. I've only heard of one um, uh, pharmaceutical company uh, that is uh, engaged in in uh, continuous manufacturing. Can you name more? Absolutely. Uh -huh. I mean, there are four companies that have products approved, right? Pfizer, Eli Lilly, and Vertex, in addition to J&J. &J. We are, in, in right now, working with another half a dozen companies that are also working hard at implementing these systems. I don't want to violate confidentiality, but I can tell you, in my, I have first-hand knowledge that every major household name, brand-based pharmaceutical company is working on this. They have all the acquired equipment. They are all preparing submissions. So for brand-based pharma, this is now a, a, a choice mm -hmm. that they have made to go forward this way. Well, that's very promising. I, I, I want to work with um, all of the stakeholders um, uh, to achieve the goal of bringing uh, manufacturing back to the United States. For us to be dependent on uh, foreign countries, uh, uh, sometimes real tensions surrounding the relationships, I think is, um, uh, is really dangerous for the United States of America. We owe more to the American people, so thank you. Uh, I'll submit my uh, written questions to, uh, to the other uh, witnesses. I'll now recognize uh, the ranking member uh, of the subcommittee for his five minutes of questions. 
And again, I thank the chair. So, Mr. Kaiser, let me just start with you because you mentioned Surgicel, yes. and that got my attention, a product that I've used, not frequently because most of my surgical fields were quite hemostatic, but I recognize there are other specialties that may have a requirement for a, an absorbable hemostat like Surgicel. You're going to have to explain these terms. We're not all doctors. <laughs> I, was, I was having some inside uh, I could tell. chat with uh, uh, Dr. Bouchon. So a neurosurgeon is in the middle of an operation, opens the, or the product is popped out onto the Mayo stand, and he picks it up, and it doesn't feel right. Is that, do I understand that correctly? That's correct. And at least at that point, he had the presence of mind to say, this is not right. Did he actually use the product in that operation? Uh, he did not use the product. He, he asked uh, the circulator to, to hand off uh, another one from another lot, another box. I see. So he actually had some real product available, which is fortunate, yeah. because I and presume- the committee, the sur Surgistel is a hemostatic patch that uh, is used to control bleeding during and after surgery. Right, it comes in a foil package yep. and they pop it open onto the sterile field. It looks like a little piece of uh, cloth with a fairly fi fi wide weave pattern. Yes. And you camp it down into the area where the, the bleeding is problematic and it provides a matrix for the body's own clotting mechanism to adhere to and, and that way achieves uh, achieves uh, uh, hemostasis or, or lack of bleeding in that area, which is obviously a good thing before you close up a surgical incision. And it's absorbable, so it stays in the body and is eventually absorbed. So this product that, did anyone end up testing him? I mean, what, what, would it would have actually absorbed had it been left in this person's brain or spine? Yeah, so the, so the product was tested. So the, the hospital sent it back into our quality organization who conducted their tests, their investigation. Uh, where we identified that it was indeed not ours, uh, but it was counterfeit, and it was also non-sterile, which represents a significant wow. risk. Holy smackers. Wow. Yeah. wow. Um, that is, you know, I can't, can't convey how concerning that is. Um, just like Mr. Guthrie, I went to the JFK International Mail Facility with Dr. Gottlieb. We saw a number of things. Uh, and at that point, I think even just uh, pharmaceutical products could not be returned to that was something that occurred as part of the Support Act in H.R. 6. But what was related to us that day, that sometimes this package that contained something that was highly suspect, um, all they could do was return it back to the people that had shipped it in the first place. And that, on occasion, a package would just simply recirculate. Well, let's try it again. And literally have the same markings from either Customs Border Protection or the FDA on the package. So this is, uh, this is critical to be able to not just intercept this stuff, but get it out of circulation, no pun intended, but just to get it out of, get it out of everyone's, everyone's uh, lives. So what's the role of, say, your company, of Johnson & Johnson, uh, throughout the process of notification of a counterfeit medical device and then to remove the device from, uh, from the availability? Well, in this particular case, uh, since we were notified by the hospital, uh, we conducted a thorough investigation. We identified the source manufacturer in India. Uh, it was coming through a distributor in Dubai through some rogue uh, gray market distributors in Florida and ultimately into this hospital. So we worked very closely with FDA and other law enforcement agencies to take the counterfeiter down quickly. Uh, we also worked with the FDA to notify customers to communicate out. Um, it's, it's an ongoing investigation that goes beyond Surgicel. There are other medical devices that are at risk in this investigation as well. And, and when you say take down, was, it, was this individual or, or were there individuals who were actually arrested for uh, this? Yes. In, in India, there were arrests taken and civil and criminal yeah. actions are in progress. They're in progress. Okay. I was going to ask what the result of those were. Uh, Dr. Muzio, just before, we, uh, before my time expires, back in 2012, we were doing an FDA reauthorization for drugs and devices. And at that time, drug shortages were a thing. I, I know they're still a thing, but they were really significant at that point. And anesthetic drugs and emergency room drugs, some, some really some common, some common stuff, not not exotic stuff, was was just simply unavailable. So, and I think at that point we heard from Dr. Woodcock at FDA about some of the things that could be done 
to assist with alleviating or preventing drug shortages. So continuing, continuous manufacturing, I assume, has a role in this as well. Yes, it does. Uh, so there are two different dimensions to this. First, a large fraction of drug shortages are caused by emerging quality problems. Continuous manufacturing systems are much more robust and they allow much more monitoring. So the likelihood of undetected quality issues when you're making the drug using a continuous method is much lower. So if we were making many pharmaceutical products using continuous systems, those quality issues would be less frequent. That's one issue. But there is another dimension that is equally important. One of the biggest advantages of continuous manufacturing systems is that they allow you to do experiments much, much more quickly than batch systems. Uh, it typically takes 50 or 60 experiments to develop a process, you could say. In batch manufacturing, that takes weeks, sometimes months. In continuous manufacturing, you can do the same number of experiments in a few days. So if there is a, a shortage caused by a quality problem with one particular formulation, and we need to develop an alternative formulation, and it is the kind of drug that can be manufactured by continuous processes, we could develop a substitute product or a substitute process in just days. Very, very good. I see my time's expired, so I'll, I'll yield back to the chair, but that, I may follow up with some questions for you on that. The gentleman yields back. It's a pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Oregon, uh, Mr. Schrader, for his five minutes of questions. Dr. Musio, uh, I'm, I'm a little unclear how continuous manufacturing alleviates the drug shortages. I don't, I, I can see where it's an efficient way to do things and the quality control could be superior uh, because of the ongoing manufacturing process. But, you know, how is it going to bring back atropine ointment and, you know, phenobarb and prednisone as, as on a regular basis? These are shortage drugs out there. How's that going to happen? Well, it's not a magic bullet that you could use today for everything. It has been well developed for certain kinds of products. It could also be further developed as a, as a technology option for other kinds of products. But for the products when you can use continuous manufacturing, as I mentioned, you can develop an alternative manufacturing approach very quickly. You can also use that using a relatively small amount of raw materials that might be scarce in a situation of shortage. So I just so, don't, I don't see, are any of the sh companies you've talked about uh, looking to do some of these drugs that there are shortages in right now? At the present time, I believe most companies are focusing on their flagship products. Sure. Uh, that would for, be my thinking, too. I'm a little worried about us kind of picking winners and losers in terms of different, because brand names are already doing this. They don't need our help. It is the generics. It is small companies trying to get started. I, I don't know how we would pick those that get to take advantage of the federal process, the federal money, and those that don't. Well, and maybe I can share one personal experience. One of the, our sponsors about five or six years ago challenged us to see whether we could actually create new formulations and processes for five or six products that they would give us. So they brought raw materials to us, and the challenge was, can you have a working process and a viable product within a month for these six products? So two of the six were not suitable. For the other four, we were able to, within a month, create an alternative formulation and a process. So if we had the technology in place in enough locations, there would be the ability to do very fast development. That would be the response. Okay. Okay. Well, I share the chairwoman's interest in wanting to make sure we control more of our basic active ingredient manufacturing here in this country and maybe some more discussion on how we would use this process as part of that. Uh, I, I like the idea of having a... Uh, uh, ubiquitous or at least regionally based uh, uh, manufacturing platform that different companies could access, uh, but picking which drugs, I think that, that, that would require a lot of work. Uh, Dr. Chua, um, the uh, drug exclusivity, why not just get rid of criteria number two? Why, why even, you know, give them an, if you're, why would a company bring a dr drug to market if they can't actually cover their costs? That makes no sense to me. It's a good question. I think um, that cost recovery prong um, was in there uh, in case a drug did not treat a, a condition that um, was rare, by <laughs> that, which in that, in that regard is 200,000 or fewer Americans. Uh, but what's still what, but was still potentially an important drug, um, just not one that could recoup its costs. Um, 
there have only been three of those drugs um, that have been designated through the cost recovery prong since 1983. So it is not a commonly used pathway. Yeah, Madam Chair, I'd just say we get rid of that criteria. It's, it's confusing. We're adding a new layer of interpretation of a criteria that has only been used three times since 1983. And I say the, the manufacturing and the pharmaceutical companies have come a long, long way, and you know they're going to be able to uh, go through continuous uh, manufacturing or some other process, be able to decide how to go about making these great orphan drugs. We're in a whole new era than we were, uh, I think, uh, back in uh, 1983. Um, I guess a uh, question, why, Dr. Allen or others, you know, why, why aren't uh, generics able to update their labels now? I mean, that seems like an obvious thing. In most instances, they, they are. There is um, frequently used mechanisms, um, most notably when the RLD is still in existence, if the brand is still there, the brand may make adjustments to its label to reflect changes in the context of use and the generic relatively automatically will reflect that. The issue that the Modern Labeling Act is, uh, is addressing is those instances in which the original branded product has exited the market. And so those remaining generics are not able to change their label under current but law. But why? They still have to, under law, because they have the sameness clause that was established to establish the generic market requires them to uh, maintain the same label as the original product. When that I product see. leaves, there's nothing to there's nothing to, to reflect. All right, very good. Uh, thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize uh, the former chairman of the full committee um, from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, the hearing, and uh, I do have a number of questions. Uh, Dr. Allen, just a quick thing, you know, when it, it, it seems like a common sense bill, this uh, H.R. 5668, to up, update the labels. Has FDA actually, have they asked, if, are you aware if they've asked that we actually update this? I mean, I, it just seems so common sense that you, you'd like to think that they would have just said, don't need legislation. Well, I, I guess to give a little bit of context, you know, at least in the oncology space, although this is a, a phenomenon that occurs well beyond oncology, um, there has been initiatives by the FDA's Oncology Center of Excellence through a project they've called Project Renewal that has begun to identify several of these older drug labels that have are significantly drifted out of date. Um, they've identified 44 products so far um, that would benefit from a re-review. The challenge is about a quarter of those fall into this withdrawn RLD. So a quarter of those products just simply legally are not able to be updated without the passage of the modern act. And I, I want to also say, uh, Mr. Kaiser, 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 um, you know, you talk about, uh, and, and Dr. Burgess has talked a lot about this. I've not actually, I tried to avoid New York, I'll confess, uh, particularly Newark or JFK. I don't know where you went. I like to take Amtrak. Um, Eight, this uh, safeguarding therapy, it just seems so sensible, so sensible to try and get it done, H.R. 5663. But in your testimony, you, you indicated that a million people every year, according to Interpol, uh, probably die because of counterfeit drugs or devices, What? mostly in developing countries. So can you explain a little bit about what is the, what are the drugs that, and, uh, I mean, can you break that down a little bit for us? Uh, I, I probably don't have it down to the drug level. I would say it's mostly in developing countries. We don't see it as much in the United States as we see it in, in Africa or in, in maybe in India or other parts of the world. So how large a staff do you have? I have 32 people on my team, 32 direct reports. Um, wow. So in, you indicated that you would talk a little bit more uh, in detail about your uh, work with the FDA. Would you like to do that now? During some I, I would time? love to. It's, uh, FDA has been absolutely uh, instrumental and critical in the work that we've done with um, this Surgicel. And um, it's, OCI has been a big part of um, our ongoing investigations. The FDA has also been very helpful in, in helping us to communicate it to uh, the providers. To, to the patients, to help safeguard the patients. So FDA has uh, continued to be a very strong ally uh, for us to work with on my team. And I do believe that uh, HR 5663 is an opportunity for us to even go deeper 
um, and we can continue to develop tools and resources from there. You may know that when I was chair, we passed a track and trace a bipartisan bill. I think it was at the end of the session, but we were able to, to shepherd it through both the House and the Senate. Has that helped give you a little bit more uh, resources to work with the FDA to identify these counterfeit drugs and devices? Yeah, I look at track and trace and, and serialization as opportunities to help efforts in brand protection. Uh, but I, I can share it with you that serialization, while it's a great tool, um, serial numbers can be counterfeited as well. And, and whoever brings that serial number to market first wins. Yeah. Hmm. Yield back. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Would the gentleman uh, 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 give me just sure. 10 seconds? Uh, Dr. Muzio, I wanted to um, ask you, you, you've talked about the NAM, uh, name brand uh, drugs and continuous um, manufacturing. 90%, uh, approximately 90% of the drugs that the American people take are generics. So are generic companies uh, accessing? Um, uh, we are aware continuous of, uh, manufacturing so we are aware that some of the largest generic companies have been attempting to do that we what also that mean, have attempt? been trying yes trying what does trying. trying mean we know that in a couple of cases they bought equipment they installed it they tried to make it work but there is a large amount of know-how that is required that the brand companies created over over a decade. And Do you think that there's an issue as to whether they want to make the investment? I believe that there might be an issue about whether they have the ability to see the path to success, not having necessarily all of the know-how available in-house. I'll follow up with more. Yes, Ten thank you. seconds of my 10 mm -hmm. seconds that I gave you. <laughs> Dr. Allen, I just want to say you all, friends of cancer, have been were so helpful as we worked on 21st century cures. And as you know, I think as you know, we're working on a 2.0, again, a bipartisan idea. We've had a number of roundtables. I just, we're looking forward to hearing, uh, and you, I think, participate, but we're looking to, still that the door is open for us to get ideas in terms of how we can, we can expand this. I just uh, want to thank you for, for your work and your organization's work. And with that, I yield back my 10 seconds. I thank the gentleman, and he yields back. A uh, gentlewoman from California is recognized, Ms. Matsui, for her five minutes of questions. Thank you very much. And thank you for your legislation. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much for holding this important hearing. I'm pleased to have the opportunity today to discuss a bill I recently introduced with Representative Guthrie to modernize outdated drug labels. The FDA approved label is the most independent and authoritative source of safe and effective prescribing information for healthcare providers and their patients. I am greatly concerned that there is no existing mechanism to update certain generic drug labels to reflect current commonly accepted uses. Despite the critical role labels play in informing treatment decisions, safeguarding the public health, and facilitating greater use of lower cost generics. Our legislation works to specifically address outdated generic labels in situations where the brand has left the market and therefore there's no ability to update the generic drug label. I know that some stakeholders have raised concerns about certain provisions in the bill and I look forward to working with them as he moves through the regular order. Introducing this bill is just the first step of this process. Excuse me. And because I'm committed to finding the best path forward to protect consumers and modernize drug labeling while still allowing FDA to require updated labeling for drug products if new safety information emerges. That said, we need a targeted solution now that gives both patients and providers access to accurate and updated information for the generic drug products they're using in order to make safe and effective treatment decisions. Dr. Ellen. Thank you very much for being here today to discuss this important legislation. I appreciate all the work that Friends of Cancer Research has done to help identify this issue and craft a potential solution. Dr. Ellen, under current law, if FDA wanted to update an out-of-date label for certain generic drugs, could the update include any information about new or existing conditions of use, 
labeling standards, or additional uses? Can generics make these updates on their own? If there is an existing RLD. So thank you uh, and to Mr. Uh, Mr. Guthrie for introducing this bill because this is the narrow window in which these products are essentially frozen. So when it, the original RLD has been withdrawn, there is no mechanism to update for the situations that you have mentioned. Okay. The authority and for safety still right. exists. And I want to be clear about that because we've gotten those questions too. So this Absolutely. bill maintains that. Absolutely. So can we talk a bit more about off-label prescribing? Why is this practice particularly common in cancer drugs? I think just given the pace of research um, and the investments that the country have made facilitated by this committee and others, of course, in funding entities like the NIH, you see a lot of research on drugs once they're on the market. Um, and this is, continues to grow in areas around like electronic health data capture. So we continue to learn about drugs as they're used in different populations more broadly. Mm -hmm. So the ability to have off-label use is really important in terms of access in the continuing evolution of learning. Um, and I think what, uh, you know, so I, I think that the cancer community is benefits from some of the guidelines that we've been talking about, but that's not the case in all, in all therapeutic areas. Okay. So if these off-label uses are already widespread and well accepted, why is it still important to update a drug's label? What impact would this have on patients? Yeah. I, I think, as you mentioned, the drug label itself is the most authoritative, unbiased, accessible source of information. And we know patients get information about medical products that range from uh, sophisticated uh, mechanisms like Compendio, working with their doctors, and even the internet. But to have the FDA, to have the ability to have greater flexibility and authority to make sure these labels are updated, I think can instill confidence uh, in the most accessible form of information. It's from their website. Yeah. So while FDA does have the ability to require generic makers to change a label, these changes are limited to information pertaining to a product's safety. So in order to provide patients and providers with the safest, up-to-date, and highest quality prescribing information, we need a process like the one created under Modern. Yes. And it's very strategically and narrowly written so that we can do that. Okay, well, thank you very much for being here and all the work that the network has done, and appreciate your being here. Thank you so much. I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. It's a pleasure to recognize Mr. Guthrie of Kentucky for his five minutes of questions. Thank you very much. A couple of these bills are so common sense that it's hard. The questions have already been asked, it seems, moving forward. But when I was at the JFK uh, coming forward, I wish people could sit there and see that because you, you see counterfeit drugs, you see them standing in front, in front of, sitting in front of you, and people are, if they're going outside the normal distribution chains, and a lot of times people are doing it because of access to affordable pr prescription drugs, and Hopefully we as a Congress can get back to focusing on that and get a bill the President can sign. Um, but, but in the meantime, it's just not safe. If you're going to go on websites and try to, and you get counter, we got an investigation beginning on counterfeit tickets to events. If you buy a bad event, if, a counterfeit ticket, you have a bad night. If you buy a counterfeit drug, you have, can ruin your life. And, and, and so it's important. And I just want people to understand, and I was standing there and watched somebody, uh, if, if it was a, if it was a drug, they could destroy it. But if the drug was packaged with a syringe, so therefore a medical device, they couldn't. And so, Mr. Kayser, can you explain under current law what happens when a counterfeit products are discovered? What a, what's an example of a combination product which cannot be destroyed? And why H.R. 663 would improve the ability of federal government to stop the supply of counterfeit? So, uh, first question was, what, the first question is, under current law, what happens when a counterfeit so current product? current law uh, for medical devices, combination products, those are typically shipped back to whoever sent it. So thus, it, it typically remains in the supply chain, and many times it comes back through. So uh, that represents a significant risk. Yeah, so Bob, but, but why, why isn't it destroyed? Because it doesn't fall under the current law, right? So the, 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 what, we're, what you're asking mm -hmm. for in the new law would allow us to destroy medical devices and combination products under $2,500. Yeah, I understand that. I just wanted you to, br yeah. to bring that out. And then, so what's an example of a combination product? I mean, I saw a syringe with a vial of, of I guess it was insulin. Yeah, that's, that's and, an example. And they couldn't, just, if it was just insulin, they could have destroyed it because it was packaged with the, they couldn't, by law, which is that, what we need. That's a great example. Another one might be um, coronary stents, drug-eluting drug coronary stents. You know, stent is, creates the scaffolding to keep an artery open. 
uh, if it's coated with a, a drug elution, a drug that would emit to uh, help with cell proliferation. So I think those are a couple good examples of combination therapies. Well, I had a, a, a border, or one of our agent, FDA agent say at JFK that they literally have packaged, opened it, discovered it. They had to ship it back because they couldn't destroy it. They can store it, but then they ship it back and it come back to JFK exactly as they wrapped it up and sent it back. So if some people are actually ordering these, mm -hmm. the people who even they're sending them to, not even, who knows if they even put, I mean, somebody could have changed the whole product inside and sent it back to, this is how bad these people are who are trying to slip this, put this stuff through. And while well, we have to fix this and, and it should not, it should be absolutely against the law to move forward. On the labeling, I think we've discussed a lot of the reason for that. When I first started looking, I thought it was the label on the container, but that's not what we're talking about. Can you explain what labeling actually is? Because yeah. I think every, all of us think, matter of fact, it's something we need to fix. If you get over the counter, it seems like we have so much stuff required. I can't even find, do I take one or two? Is it every six or 12 hours? Because you got to keep peeling things back to, to be able to safely take out over counter. We have too much. But your labeling is different you're talking about. Could you just explain that? It, it generally refers to the entire package of information that uh, is submitted and associated with the drug that often evolves over time. Um, it includes things like the package insert that, um, that you've mentioned here. And I think that's a, that's a, a good point with the, with the bill that you've uh, introduced here. Um, will allow some of these older drugs to actually conform to um, a new format of labeling that the FDA put forth in 2006. Some of these drugs don't even conform to that at this point. They can't be changed. Right. You know, but by doing so, the, the intention there was to allow the drug label to be more accessible and more usable. Uh, for the consumers. So, so currently, if, if it's not label updated, label like it could be, what's happening to the patients currently? How are physicians, are they not able to use it in a prescribed way that they think it'd be the? In many instances, um, particularly in oncology, there is the uh, accessibility to expert developed guidelines. Things like the National Comprehensive Cancer Network has regularly um, uh, updated guidelines, but those are typically accessible to, um, to expert oncologists, perhaps in an academic setting. So still the most accessible um, source of information would be to look up the drug label um, around things like different doses, and those doses can change over time depending on the context of use. So, so if oncologists may not have access to the best information for a specific drug for a specific patient? Not on these outdated labels. They would have to look elsewhere than the label in order to access it. Thanks, and I'm looking forward to more testimony from Dr. Muzio on the bill that I'm doing with Dr. Plum. I mean, uh, Chair Plum. I'm out of time, but um, I'm, I know you. I was going to talk about drug shortages, and you've addressed that. So thank you for thank you. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I now would like to recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, for his five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to talk about uh, the orphan drug bill in particular. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues, uh, including uh, uh, Representatives Carter and, v and McKinley in this uh, committee, for introducing uh, their bill, uh, which is very similar to a bill I introduced on orphan drugs. Uh, we all support the orphan drug program, uh, but it, there, it, and I, it provides those incentives to get uh, drugs to treat rare diseases. Uh, but I'm really concerned uh, about what I regard as the significant abuse of the, uh, of the bill. Pharmaceutical companies are seeking orphan drug status for some of their best-selling drugs. That's not what that orphan drug designation was about. Uh, and in November of 2018, there was a GA GAO report on orphan drugs that found that 38% of the drug approvals from 08 to 17 were for drugs that had been previously approved uh, for either mass market or uh, rare disease use. And some of the best-selling drugs on the market now have orphan status, including Umera, Remicade, and Imbril. Uh, these drugs have billions of dollars in annual sales, and they don't need the orphan status. That's certainly as I see it. Um, it's also becoming a real problem in the 340B program because drug manufacturers want to avoid including these drugs in the 340B program, even though they're used for many uh, fairly common uh, uh, treatments. Uh, so I do s uh, strongly support 4712, HR 4712, because it would take steps to begin to close loopholes and ensure orphan drug status is only being used for tr true orphan drugs. Uh, Mr. Kayser, I want to ask you uh, about Johnson & Johnson's drug 
uh, Imbruvica, am I saying that right? Imbruvica. Imbruvica, as I understand it, had about 2.6 billion in sales in 2018, and sales are expected to range from five to nine and nine and a half billion in 2020. And the drug currently has 10 orphan indications. Uh, is it the view of Johnson & Johnson that the orphan drug program was intended to be used 10 different times for one drug? Representative Welsh, that's a fantastic question. But it's What's the answer? Way outside of the yeah, scope of, uh, my, my microphone is on. Yes, uh, uh, the focus of my work is in counterfeiting and brand protection. And um, I'd be very happy to work with my government affairs team, my team back in New Jersey, uh, to come back with somebody. You know, I, I, with all due respect, yes, I, I mean, I, it's not, the, we have a hearing today scheduled on orphan drugs. So it's not like th this should be a surprise that this question gets raised. Johnson & Johnson is doing a 10 for one situation here with this drug. You want to check with somebody now, use your phone, ask, tell us what Johnson & Johnson's position is and whether this is an abuse of the orphan drug status? I'd be happy to, to work with our folks back in uh, at Johnson & Johnson to get the right person to come back in. <laughs> yeah, speak. okay, I'm gonna express my frustration here. We hear that a lot from witnesses, okay. and then you're gone. I mean, the hearing is now, it was noticed. We knew we were gonna be talking about orphan drugs. I'm asking a simple, straightforward question, and you're telling me you'll get back to me. And once you walk out that door, you'll be gone, and I'll never hear from you again. So anyway, no more. You, let me ask uh, uh, Dr. Chow. I, I, did I pronounce your name correctly? It's Dr. Chua. Chua, thank you very much. Uh, what's the best way to address this issue of what I am defining, as I see it, the abuse of the orphan drug status? I think this is a difficult issue. Um, I think um, these quote-unquote partial orphan drugs, those with both orphan and non-orphan indications, um, it is true that they tend to be um, extreme uh, bestsellers. In fact, I think seven of the ten uh, top-selling drugs in the world are these partial orphan drugs, and it does raise difficult questions about whether orphan drug incentives are being used in a manner consistent with the purpose of the Orphan Drug Act, um, which was designed really to incentivize the development of treatments that otherwise would have limited economic potential. Well, is it your experience that if there's any room for a loophole, then the pharmaceutical companies will drive their uh, truck through it to be able to get the, the, the highest price possible at the expense of taxpayers and employers who are paying for these prescriptions? I think pharmaceutical companies have an incentive to maximize their profit, and if there is an opportunity to, um, if if the rules allow um, for them to okay. get I mean, around it, certain, uh, right. well, I just then yes. Thank you. My time is up, but I just want to strongly endorse uh, this bipartisan uh, legislation that would try to start addressing this abuse on pricing power by pharma. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Let, let me just make a quick comment, and that is that uh, I don't know a time when, uh, if a witness cannot give an answer, uh, that members have come forward and said they've never answered the question. Uh, it's my understanding that Mr. Uh, Kayser is here uh, relative to a specific issue. Um, the one that you, the question that you asked, is a very important one, uh, but. That's not his expertise. So uh, we'll work together and make sure that you get the full information from Johnson & Johnson. But uh, it's, it's, it's a little unfair to press him. He's here representing another department, another issue, and he's being honest and saying, I can't give you, I'm not the one that can give you the answer. You need, we all need to get the answer. You've raised a very important question. But uh, uh, I, we all need to appreciate that Mr. Kayser is not the one that um, he doesn't know. He's being honest. So we'll get the information. Who's next? Uh, the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Thank you, Madam Walden. Chair. You're on. I have it. I have a question You're on. for Mr. Kayser <laughs> about counterfeit products. And, and what I want to know is, is how Johnson Johnson typically becomes aware uh, that a counterfeit of one of their products has entered the supply chain. How does that happen? Give us the steps. Well, 
we do ongoing market monitoring. So physical market surveys, online market surveys, constantly monitoring the internet 24 seven all around the world. So we make it our business to constantly survey the world to see what's going on. All right, and how do these counterfeit products typically make their way into the U.S. market? I mean, we know about some of the mail facilities, yeah. and, and Dr. Burgess has been up to see some uh, last Congress. And so I was going to say the, uh, the IMF, right, the, the, the international mailing facilities are, are a source. Yeah. Uh, but it's the Internet. It's the Internet and, and unauthorized. Just direct shipping? I'm sorry? Just direct shipping? Direct shipping, yeah. Huh. All right. And then how would, how would extending FDA's administrative destruction authority to medical devices complement uh, Johnson & Johnson's efforts to keep these potentially dangerous counterfeit products out of the hands of the unwitting providers and patients? Excellent question. I think it's, it's right in front of us with H.R. 5663 would mm -hmm. be a great opportunity for us uh, to extend that authority to the FDA on this, this inbound at these international mail facilities. Okay. Let me ask you this, too. When, when you find these, these counterfeit products on the Internet, what kind of relationship do you have with some of the Internet uh, companies to get those, product, get those ads, those whatever, taken down, taken off? Uh, do you have a good relationship there? Do they respond? Do they not respond? Some better than others? Some better than others, but typically uh, we have very strong relationships with them. We have to. Uh, but just like J&J &J or any other company, people come and go, and when yeah. people go, sometimes you have to start all over again. Uh, but my team is uh, very closely connected with these marketplaces and constantly helping to improve. And so d do any of them, like, push back and say, no, nah, we're not going to do that, that's your problem? Um, probably not that blatantly, no. Uh, <laughs> they, they at least put a good face forward. To yeah, do they say, oh, we'll take a look at it and never get back to you? I, I'd say they're becoming much more amenable. All right. Is there anything we need to do in that space? I think, I think for starters, let's, let's push 5663 through, and I do think that there are opportunities for other tools, other resources, and, and how we can expand the authority uh, into other areas. Mm -hmm. I know in, in prior Congresses we've had hearings with counterfeit medicines. I remember one years ago where they brought in samples in bags and said, you pick the one that's counterfeit, and none of us could. I mean, they looked exactly alike. Yeah. So how pervasive is this? It's, it's a pervasive problem, and, it, and it's getting much worse. I think the counterfeiters are very agile. They're very good. Uh, many times the packaging that, that counterfeiters uh, use are as good or better than what we use yeah. because there's really nothing good inside of it. And, and where is this coming from mostly? Um, it's, it's, I'd say it's an equal opportunity world, but uh, <laughs> predominantly from Asia, a lot from China and India, the Middle East. Uh-huh. All right. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kaiser, uh, is there, would there be a, uh, would, would the following put a dent in what you're describing? If there was a requirement uh, for internet providers uh, to flag and say, not FDA approved? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I'm just saying Thank no. You. Yeah, I, 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 Dr. Yeah. Burgess, I, I yield to you. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, just to answer part of your question, at the International Mail Facility, yeah. and I know it's not under our jurisdiction, but it's really pretty primitive. I mean, these are buildings that were built back in the 1930s. Some places they lack internet access in some segments of the building. Customs and Border Protection is good about providing yeah. the FDA the space that they have, but I know it's an Oversight Government Reform Committee challenge, but perhaps we ought to help them, and I've, I've talked to members of that committee. Uh, it, the facility needs significant upgrading, and I suspect there are other facilities that do as well. Maybe that can be part of the infrastructure package. Yeah, that would be good. And let me just suggest there's nothing that's not actually under our jurisdiction. As a, as a former chairman, I just want to put that on the record. We start there and then make them try and claw it out of our hands. Very so, important that statement. Correct. That's All right. Yeah, that's going to be enlarged in the committee um, <laughs> print. <laughs> With that, Madam Chair, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentlewoman from New Hampshire, uh, Ms. Custer, is uh, recognized for her five minutes of questions. Thank you very much. I was thinking we would go to uh, Michigan first, so my apologies. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm delighted to be here with all of you today. I wanted to focus in on uh, the Dairy Pride Act. I served for six years on the Agriculture Committee. And um, I think I'm in the first panel. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me skip to the 
Orphan Drug Act, I apologize. By monopolizing the market, how many have been unable to access life-saving medication? And I'm wondering how many have been deterred from evidence-based treatment out of fear from the current formulation? Um, these are questions that we need to address, and I want to turn to Dr. Chu, if I could. In 1994, the FDA granted Subutex, commonly known as buprenorphine, orphan drug status, even though opioid use disorder is not a rare disease. Your testimony described sublocades orphan approval as an abuse of orphan drug policy, but also a catastrophe in the treatment of opioid use disorder. Can you detail how the cost of buprenorphine is a barrier to opioid use disorder treatment and how the gaming of the Orphan Drug Act has contributed to that prohibitive cost? Thank you for that question. Um, so the current list price for Sublocade for each shot of um, monthly shot is $2,000. Um, what that does is two things. One, it, one is that it makes insurers reticent to cover it or at least um, more willing to put up barriers such as prior authorization. Um, the other thing that it does is that it exposes patients to out-of-pocket costs, particularly those who are privately insured and who have, um, have to pay a, a portion of a drug's price through deductibles or coinsurance. So um, absolutely the price of buprenorphine uh, products and of opioid use disorder medications more generally um, can be a deterrent um, to receipt of um, a safe and effective care. And one of the greatest challenges associated with medication-assisted treatment in the criminal justice setting has been the fear of diversion. Subutex and Suboxone were tablets placed under the tongue while ne uh, newer extended release formulations by another company could not enter the market due to this monopoly established by the gaming of the Orphan Drug Act. How might the entrance of new formulations of buprenorphine improve treatment in vulnerable populations? Right, that, that's a really good question too. So these extended release um, once monthly injections have a couple of advantages. One of them is that you don't have to remember to take your buprenorphine every day. So it's going to promote adherence. Um, the other, um, in this particular instance, is that um, if you substitute um, a monthly injection for a prescription for, uh, for example, Suboxone um, film, um, there's less potential for that film to be diverted um, on the black market uh, because the buprenorphine is being controlled essentially uh, in that sense by a monthly injection. That's helpful, thank you. And how um, is the legislation before us today effective in closing the loophole that's prevented other companies from entering the market with new formulations? This uh, bill, H.R. 4712, would close the loophole that allowed Sublocade to gain orphan exclusivity in the first place. Uh, sorry, orphan drug status, orphan approval. Um, and if in the, in the event that FDA's decision to revoke Sublocade's orphan status is overturned, it would permanently bar the possibility of exclusivity for Sublocade, um, which as mentioned before, would block out new buprenorphine products until 2024. So you think overall that would be beneficial for uh, Americans, including vulnerable populations and those that are receiving their medically assisted treatment, that this will improve access yes. to treatment for substance use disorder? Yes, uh, we know that medications for opioid use disorder are extremely infective, effective, and yet they are um, widely underused. Um, so we need to do whatever, whatever we can um, to increase use, um, increase choice, increase innovation, uh, make sure that there are products that work for patients um, because each one of these products has different properties. They're administered differently. They have different kind of advantages and disadvantages. And we just need to make sure that um, we are doing everything that we can um, to give um, people the best chance um, to um, treat opioid use disorder. Well, I want to thank you for being with us today and certainly on behalf of my constituents and on behalf of our bipartisan opioid task force, I appreciate the work that you're doing and I would urge my colleagues to support the bill. And with that, I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. A pleasure to recognize Mr. Griffith uh, from the great state of Virginia for his five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. We've, uh, Dr. Musio, we've all been following the coronavirus outbreak over the last couple of weeks. 
Your testimony discusses the ability of the continuous manufacturing process to more quickly respond to emergency needs. In a world where continuous manufacturing was the norm, how would you foresee a response to an outbreak like the one we're currently watching play out? Thank you for the question. I, I think it's an excellent question. So if we had the technologies in place so that we could implement these rapid development methods for a wide variety of products, if some of the products or the, you know, the drug substances that are known or we would want to see whether they are good and effective for treating an emerging disease were um, manufacturable by continuous manufacturing systems, the response would be to assign the task of creating multiple versions of a potential product to a manufacturer that is enabled and knowledgeable, that manufacturer could come back with uh, suitable versions of a possible product in days or weeks, which is much faster than you can do today. Thank you very much. That's what I was looking for, it's much faster than what we can do today. Uh, I'm going to yield now to my good friend from Indiana, Dr. Bouchon. Thank you for yielding. Uh, Mr. Kaiser, I was interested when we were talking about deaths related to uh, um, counterfeit medications or devices, and it, it seems to me that likely that is related to people not getting the active component of the drug they're supposed to be getting, and therefore they will you know, not do well and maybe pass away based on the fact they're not getting, or is it because of the toxicity? Do we know? Because I think when you throw out the number of a million people dying from counterfeits, I do think from a public perception standpoint, it's important to understand conceptually, you know, what does that actually mean? I mean, what is the American public, you know, you take the pill and you, you die, you know, or is it just because you have, uh, you're get, they're getting a chemotherapeutic agent that's, doesn't have active component. Do you have any breakdown on that at all? Uh, great question, and, and I really don't. The Interpol data doesn't get that deep on specific products. You know, I can speak to some of the things that we've seen. Um, it's, it, it, it's both. There can be toxic things in, in the drug, or there could be a lack of an API that causes interruption in the therapy. Um, but regardless, if it's not coming from an authorized manufacturer, you're at risk. Yeah, I'm not implying that it's bad, not, you know, that, they're, that it's not bad to have counterfeit drugs or products, right? I'm just saying I, I think when, you know, when we have public hearings, it's important, you know, American people are watching that, you know, a million people are dying from counterfeit drugs, that it's important for people to understand why is that is because, like I said, you take the pill and you, you know, you don't want people to stop taking their medicines. That's, that's what my point is I'm getting at because people will do that based on these type of things, right? And so it's important to understand that. Most likely, in my view, it's probably because the active component is much less prominent in the counterfeit than, than it would be in a in a J and J drug or product. But I don't know, and that'd be important to understand. Um, so, uh, 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 Dr. Muzio, uh, why hasn't the private sector in the United States adopted continuous manufacturing? I mean, it, it you know it, it's a free market. Uh, if it's it it seems like. You know, in a lot of other industries, you have this type of continuous process. Why, why haven't we done it? It's a really good question. Uh, Technology-wise, we could have done this 30 years ago. Um, I think it's because it took universities to procure the funding, create the partnership, demonstrate that the technology would work, be able to work in a non-adversarial way with the regulators. FDA played a phenomenal leadership role, very quickly promoting adoption, very quickly telling companies it was safe to do. When I started working on this 20 years ago, pharmaceutical companies were telling me that the FDA was never going to let them do it. Right, because when I talked to FDA, FDA said, oh, we want them to do it, and then it happened. To finish up, that was the other part of the question I was going to ask is what's the what is the is currently the greatest barrier and what has been the greatest barrier to the adoption? Is it just the marketplace hasn't supported it or is there are there government barriers? And you I think you mentioned the FDA, but what can we do here to change that? Well, so the greatest barrier to adoption by companies that are not doing it yet is what I said earlier several times, is that there is a large amount of know how that you need and they need to be able to access that know-how. Okay, thank you. I yield back to Morgan. And I yield back to the chair. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. 
a uh, pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Delaware, Ms. Blunt Rochester, for her five minutes of questions. Oh, sorry, Kelly. Oh, I'm sorry. Who is it? Ms. Kelly. Ms. Kelly from the great state of Illinois, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimonies today, and thank you to Chairwoman Eshu for holding this important hearing on the safety and transparency of food and drugs. The Orphan Drug Act was a critical piece of legislation as it encourages the development of drugs for rare diseases that may otherwise not have been developed. However, as Dr. Chua mentions in his testimony, there have been instances in which this policy has been abused. In your testimony, you mentioned how Sublicade's orphan drug approval was an abuse of orphan drug policy. Can you explain how this abuse impacts patients' access to affordable drugs by preventing other treatments uh, from the market? So when you get orphan drug exclusivity, um, what that means is that FDA can't approve any other competing products that contain the same medication, which in this case is buprenorphine, um, to treat the same disorder, which in this case is opioid use disorder, for seven years. So given the timing of Sublicade's approval, um, which was November of 2017, um, that meant that if exclusivity had been granted to Sublicade, there would be no competitors, no new, no innovation, no new buprenorphine products until December 2, 2024, in the midst of the worst public health crisis, arguably, of, of, of this generation, um, that strikes me as the definition of an abuse of orphan drug policy. While many of us have concerns about access to affordable medicine, we all recognize the need to develop drugs to treat rare orphan diseases. We want to make sure that we have a policy that is tailored to fix this particular problem. Can you speak to the scope of the fix included in H.R. 4712? Will this bill do anything to harm the incentives we have it's a great place question. To treat patients with rare diseases. This is a great question, I, and I want to emphasize that the scope of HR four seven one two is limited. Um, it would only affect um, the three drugs that have ever been designated through the cost recovery prong uh, designation, uh, which is the unprofitability um, kind of pathway, um, and actually only two because one of them one of them's uh, subutex has been revoked. One of the designation has been revoked, so it's actually only two drugs. Um, and it would also affect any future approvals that occurred um, through under a cost recovery prong designation. So it, it really does not affect a lot of drugs. Um, but I, again, I want to emphasize how important this bill is, uh, even though it has a limited scope, um, which is that it's going to protect uh, um, patients from the possibility of not being able to access new, innovative buprenorphine products until 2024. Thank you so much. And Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman yields back. Um, uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bilirakis, is recognized for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Kayser, uh, does the rise of e-commerce create additional challenges in monitoring for counterfeit goods? Uh, I think I know the answer to that question. Uh, if so, uh, what, in what ways do they? I've been uh, involved with brand protection, anti-counterfeiting anti for seven years, and it's, uh, I'd say, put a very dark shadow in my life, and I see the world a little bit different. I see that the e-commerce space, the Internet, provides the perfect playground for bad actors. Uh, many times, counterfeiters are, are third-party sellers that are hiding behind a brand name that's very reputable, uh, but when you purchase, if you don't look closely, uh, you can end up with counterfeit goods. Yeah. Are brands uh, working with e-commerce businesses to, to crack down on counterfeit goods? If so, how? I'm sorry, what was the question? Okay. Are brand, uh, brands working with e-commerce businesses to crack down on counterfeit go uh, goods? Yeah, we're, we're constantly working across the e-commerce platforms uh, to detect ongoing illicit trade and, and to take them down. Um, we're, we, at Johnson & Johnson, are illicit trade analytics, and we work with external uh, companies to help us to constantly monitor the Internet, the e-commerce space, uh, and we take down tens of thousands of sites per year. Okay, good. Do all products run the same risk of uh, being counterfeited? Uh, if not, which products carry the most risk of uh, being counterfeited? Counter counterfeiters are very shrewd businessmen. They're, they're looking for big brands, recognizable brands, um, that typically have strong market share and strong margins. So 
I would say if, you, if you're a big brand and you're, and you're making money, you've got a big target on your back. Okay, do uh, patients and consumers play a role in addressing the problem of counterfeited goods? Uh, if so, in what way? And does Johnson and Johnson partner with consumer goods uh, groups, consumer groups, or other healthcare stakeholders? Yeah, I, th I think that there's a there's an opportunity for more consumer, more general awareness around the around the risks imposed by illicit trade and counterfeiting. Um, but they do play an important role. That that if a consumer has a bad experience or they suspect counterfeit. Uh, on all of our packaging, there's a toll-free number to contact us, and, and we urge anybody that has uh, a bad, uh, I'll say, event with a J and J product to let us know. Okay, how might Congress further support efforts to protect consumers from counterfeit goods? What other authorities should the federal government have to curtail the supply of counterfeit medical devices? As I've said uh, multiple times, I think the support of this bill is enormous opportunity. I think it's it's low-hanging fruit. Um, and I've alluded to that I, I think getting this in place and opportunities to explore other tools. Um, I've heard many references to the international mailing facilities and uh, the resources there that they're old or they lack resources. And I'll share an, uh, an example or an, an, an analog that I got from uh, a friend who's at Homeland Security. And if you know anything about counterfeiting, it used to be uh, you know, the slow boat from China, per se. It was cargoes, it was containers, they were, they were large um, containers coming in. With, with e-commerce, it's changed. It's small parcels coming in through these mailing facilities. And the, uh, the analog that this uh, Homeland Security agent shared with me said, in the old days, it was as if somebody was rolling a bowling ball across the table. You knew it was awkward, it was going to be heavy, but you could probably stop mm. it. You're right. Today, it's like somebody's opened up a bucket of marbles and rolled it across the table. Yeah. And you can catch a few, but a lot more are going to get through. Yeah. So I think that we have a lot of opportunities to continue to improve. All right, thank you very much. Anyone want my, my time? Oh, okay, please, please. I yield. The gentleman for yielding. Uh, do you believe that the most effect effective thing that we could do is to add to the bill uh, that since these are, it's illicit, yes. that no platform be allowed to carry them, to advertise them. So I mean, Dr. Burgess just showed me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it was on your iPad. Yeah, it wasn't fentanyl's coming. on sale. Yeah, 80% fent off. 80% off on fentanyl. So, yeah, so yeah, if, if uh, it's, it's, why don't we just shut this, do, uh, do the strongest language just to shut this thing down? If it's, if it's that blatantly obvious, I completely agree. Good. Okay. I thank the gentleman for yielding. But, but the gentleman ask. yield to me for one additional yeah, second? I, and it just really, the gentleman had a good observation. One of the things I saw uh, when I was at the International Mail Facility, it wasn't a device, it was, it was a drug, it was Botox, counterfeit Botox. And, the, man, the packaging was just superb. You could not tell any difference between regular allergen produced Botox. The problem with Botox is, of course, well, one thing, if it's not sterile, as you said, with the surgical cell, but if the potency's off, okay, if it's too mild, the wrinkle's still there. If it's too potent, that's a potent neurotoxin, yeah. and it could be fatal. So that's the reason we need to be so focused on this. So I thank the chair, I thank the gentleman, I'll yield back to the gentleman from Florida. Gentleman yields back. Uh, um, Happy to recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Barrigan, for her five minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kaser, one of your um, most striking parts of your testimony was the estimate that a million people, mostly in developing countries, die each year from taking counterfeit medicine. Yes. Um, there's a real danger that is posed when the counterfeit medical uh, devices are in the supply chain, and we must ensure that the proper resources and mechanisms are in place to eliminate these products so patients are protected. Additionally, representing the district uh, with the Port of Los Angeles, I know firsthand the difficulties that the ports face when it comes to inspecting and securing the large number of products that come into the country. Um, can, you, um, can you tell me about um, if you have any information on some of the more common counterfeited medical products and what are the dangers posed from these po products entering the market? And if you happen to have any idea, maybe on some that come through the ports. So is your, I apologize. Your question is, what are some of the more counterfeited products coming into the United States? 
you, do you have any information on some of the common counterfeit and medical products and the dangers from those products? And if you have any information, maybe as it pertain to those coming through ports? Yeah, it's, um, I have to say in the United States, it's been a more recent um, surge of, of counterfeit products coming into the U.S. And, and uh, associated with the surge of cell investigation, uh, the more we look, the more we find. And, and we've also found, um, Dr. Burgess might appreciate Ligaclips. Uh, Ligaclips are uh, stainless steel clips that are used for surgical procedures. Um, imagine you're having, you know, a lung removed and you need to cut the blood supply off to, that, to the lung to be, remove it. You would clip it, clip it, cut it. Um, these clips are also counterfeit, non-sterile, and there's also um, a feature on those that, that allows the clip to close securely. These don't have those serrations. So post-op uh, in recovery with the pulsation of those vessels, those clips could potentially slide off. Um, stapling devices, we're finding uh, counterfeit stapling devices. So um, this is, it's, it's right now it looks like it's probably the same source, which will help out significantly. Um, but it's a big challenge. Um, do you have any insight on what more can be done to increase resources uh, to ports uh, to be able to conduct the number of inspections necessary to dramatically reduce the number of counterfeit and medical devices um, that are coming in? To our yeah, yeah, I'm not an export, expert on, on what we would do to necessarily upgrade the ports. Um, industry is, is doing, I think, a good job. We're doing a much better job of working with customs officials, um, training them on what to look for, um, training them on what inbound freight from a company like Johnson & Johnson, where it should be coming from right. versus where the counterfeit is coming from to help them to identify it. So it's, it's an evolution. Um, and I have to say that I yeah, take my hat off to Homeland Security, Customs and Border Patrol are outstanding partners in our efforts. Yeah, I've done a tour down at the port and um, yeah. it's the collaboration is key, knowing what to look for. Um, they have an entire room where you can walk in and see counterfeit purses, and I'm sure those are a little easier to identify maybe than some of these medical uh, devices. So um, uh, for, for Dr. Choa, um, rare diseases are, the, are those that affect fewer than 200,000 people. Like with many diseases, various rare diseases have substantial racial disparities. Um, this includes sickle cell disease, which occurs in about one out of every uh, 365 Af African American births. Like we've discussed today, medications that treat these rare diseases receive orphan drug designations, such as ARU-1801, a potential gene therapy for sickle cell disease uh, that the FDA recently gave orphan drug status. Um, because of exclusivity rules, um, it's harder for lower cost generics to come to market quickly. Uh, while the rules are beneficial to help incentivize the development of orphan drugs, uh, we must make sure there aren't bad actors that are taking advantage of the system. Um, how will the Orphan Drug Exclusivity Act help reduce the overall cost of prescription drugs so that patients can afford the treatments they require? So th I agree with all your points. Uh, I think they're very good points. Um, again, this bill has a very limited scope. It would only affect um, orphan drug designations that occurred under the cost recovery prong, um, which has only happened three times in the history of the Orphan Drug Act. Um, to your question about cost, um, Right now, uh, Sublocade has a three-year period of exclusivity because it's, uh, because it's just a standard exclusivity that's granted for a new formulation of a previously approved drug. Um, so right now, as I mentioned, um, the, the list price for each monthly shot is 2000 And that's because the, the, the company, Dindivier, can charge what it wants. It, it's the only uh, medication on the market. And again, that, that, there's a trade-off for, for that, right? We, we, we want to be able to reward companies for our innovation, um, but, there are, but there are downsides to that as well. Um, and, and so walking that fine balance is really important. In this situation, I think the idea of, being, of extending that monopoly to, to 2024 is unconsciousable. Uh, I can't even say that word, unconsciousable <laughs> um, in the context of the uh, opioid epidemic. Right. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Indiana, Ms. Brooks.
Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, thank you so much for holding this really important hearing. I think it, it builds on past hearings we've had, specifically um, as it relates to active pharmaceutical ingredients, and I'd like to talk to you, Dr. Muzio, about continuous pharmaceutical manufacturing that you um, are such an expert in. I uh, represent Indiana, one of the largest manufacturing states in the country. Purdue University has been one of those, six, one of those universities that's partnered um, to help advance continuous manufacturing research and then also Eli Lilly in Indianapolis. I represent many of their employers, their employees, their trailblazer in this field, um, and I've toured their manufacturing facilities. But one of the concerns that this committee, I think, has learned a lot about and we're continuing to explore is the real threats posed by China, India, um, and overseas with respect to the active pharmaceutical ingredient uh, adulteration. Um, and now that we're so focused uh, on uh, the, the chairwoman of this committee and I um, have been very focused on the biological threats and now with what's happening with coronavirus, how can we accelerate in this country um, the continuous manufacturing in this country? Um, certainly, um, we, I think, probably need to have a reduction in many ways on foreign manufacturers. Uh, although many of our companies are international and are multinational companies, but if we want to bring back more continuous manufacturing uh, processes here, um, you've connected our universities and you've said the largest amount of know-how comes from the universities. Why is it the manufacturers themselves um, are apparently choosing to rely on the universities and what do we need to do to accelerate either the uh, expertise in both our higher ed institutions as well as our manufacturers? That's, that's a very good question. Thank you. So I, I think historically the reason why it took the partnership is because of the ability to build a different relationship with regulators as well as uh, to demonstrate the technology in a non-competitive, non-confrontational situation where everybody could benefit from it. So that was our role historically, and you are absolutely correct, Purdue was our uh, one of our uh, most appreciated partners. We worked together on this. Going forward, now you have some companies that do know how to do this, and you have many, many companies that don't. So. One way to accelerate this is to, as I said already, make the knowledge available, but in addition to that, create an environment where the technology can be demonstrated, where they can come with their drug substance and we can create the process and turn it into product. Also, I want to talk for just one second about the APIs that you refer to, right? We have to distinguish, finish those manufacturing from API manufacturing. Continuous manufacturing can help as well in API manufacturing and creating agile ways to uh, recreate the manufacturing capacity that we have lost. Uh, it's a slightly different application, but the, the principles are similar. So you ask me what you can do, is to provide the support, to provide the resources so that we can create the centers that can do this job and can help everybody move forward. And um, what would you say uh, with respect to the grants that 21st Century Cures was all about? Um, really advancing continuous manufacturing, um, how, how widespread do we need for uh, these grants to, uh, you know, how, what amount might we say is needed to help our higher ed institutions get engaged in this process well, and in this, in you know, securing these grants. So I don't have the exact number in mind right now, but if, but I could come back to you with this, but Europe has, uh, allocated in the order of billions of euros to this activity. Uh, to their higher ed institutions? To their to initiatives with... in advanced pharmaceutical manufacturing. There was a major initiative in the UK that was worth well over a billion euros. There has been uh, what they call their 2020, right? Which they started several years ago. They had uh, very large amounts of funding allocated to this, uh, specifically promoting the creation of government academia partnerships so that they could march on quickly. Um, their centers are larger than the ones that we have had funded. Um, they also have a much more focused mandate on creating and demonstrating technology rather than basic research. Um, we are behind in this area. I, we greatly appreciate the resources that have been made available through 20th Century Cures and now hopefully through the new bill. 
but I have to say Europe has invested much more heavily on this. Okay, thank you, and I yield back. <clears throat> the gentlewoman yields back, and now uh, the gentlewoman from Delaware is uh, Blunt Rochester. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Ranking Member Burgess, for this important hearing on improving safety and transparency in America's food and drugs. Uh, I also want to thank the panel uh, for your testimony. And uh, Dr. Chua, I want to um, also specifically reference um, the fact that you really reinforced that decades ago, Congress passed the Orphan Drug Act to incentivize the development of new therapies for diseases affecting less than 200,000 people or for drugs unlikely to be profitable. Um, in May of last year, I too was concerned to learn that um, uh, Sublocade, sublocade, um, a buprenorphine drug used to treat those with substance, substance use disorder could be granted orphan drug uh, manufacturing exclusivity, even though millions of Americans suffer from addiction and the drug generates multi-million dollars in profits each year. While the FDA ultimately reversed their decision, this would have potentially kept competing products off the market artificially reduced treatment options, and potentially made a life-saving medication more costly for those who need it. Um, I recently visited a small business in my state of Delaware, um, and it was a family-owned business, a uh, car man dealer. And we spent time talking about training. We talked about, you know, cars, uh, electric vehicles. But the thing that stuck out most was the impact that the opioid crisis is having on his employees and the families that he works with. Um, our nation is in the middle of an opioid crisis. There are an average of 130 Americans dying from an opioid overdose every single day. And in Delaware, we lose someone every 22 hours to an overdose. Simply put, extending orphan drug designation in this manner would have been inconsistent with the intention of the Orphan Drug Act. Dr. Chua, uh, you're, in your testimony, you state that um, buprenorphine is an underused treatment, even with the severity of the opioid epidemic. Can you share with us why and how is patient access to buprenorphine impacted by requirements that prescribing physicians obtain an X waiver? Yes. I, these are all really good questions. I think that waiver is, in fact, one of the major barriers um, to buprenorphine prescribing. So just to put this in perspective, there are three drugs to treat, uh, FDA-approved medications to treat opioid use disorder, buprenorphine, methadone, and extended-release naltrexone. Each of them have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, an advantage of buprenorphine is that it can be prescribed in office-based settings, whereas methadone can only be dispensed in methadone treatment centers. Um, so that makes it more convenient and accessible, provided that you can find somebody who actually prescribes it. Um, in order to find somebody who uh, prescribes it, that, that somebody has to go through eight hours of training and has to um, apply for a waiver in order to prescribe buprenorphine. Um, and data show that most uh, of the people who might be candidates to um, prescribe uh, buprenorphine, uh, many primary care physicians, for example, um, have not gone through that process. Um, so I think the waiver is certainly a big, um, or Xing the waiver um, would, be, would be something that um, would greatly increase access. Excellent. Um, I have two different sets of questions that I'm trying to de decide between, so I might have to follow up with you. One was going to be focused on um, adolescence and the lack of research or data that's out there and um, what your thoughts are on, on that. But, but what is really pressing to me, I, I, we saw a JAMA network open study that found that for every three additional payments that manufacturers made to physicians per 100,000 people in the country, opioid overdose deaths increased by 18%. But the study suggests that it was the frequency of the marketing interactions, not individual payment amounts, that had a greater impact on physicians' opioid prescribing. More interactions led to increased awareness of the product, increased trust of the company, and then different prescribing practices. And so in the limited time that I have, time versus money, are there any limits on the number of interactions or amount of direct payments that manufacturers can make to physicians? Um, 
Not really. Um, as far as I can, there's no, there's no, as far as I'm aware, there is no cap on the amount of, mar of um, payments that can be made. And, and my follow-up question, and we'll follow up with you in, in writing, will be about just the relationship between uh, manufacturers and physicians and how it develops over time and how that impacts the prescribing rates. Um, I thank you, and I yield back. I'm out of time, but I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman yields back. A uh, pleasure to recognize the only pharmacist in the Congress, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Carter. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for being here. This, uh, all of this is important. Dr. Chua, I want to stay with you because the opioid epidemic is something that I've had firsthand experience at um, as a practicing pharmacist, as a legislator as well. And in, in 2009, during what could be arguably called the, the epitome of this problem, I, I was the lead sponsor of the legislation that created the Prescription Drug Monitoring Act in Georgia. And this is something that is very important to me. And, and I'm the lead sponsor on the fairness and, and the lead Republican sponsor on the Fairness and Orphan Drug Act. So I wanted, I, I want to thank you for your testimony here today because it is very important, extremely important. So let's let's talk about, and you've talked about why the bill is so important. And under the current statute, because there is a real loophole here, and we're we're closing that loophole. Can you address it very quickly? So. Essentially, anytime anybody wants to get an orphan approval and therefore exclusivity under a cost recovery prong designation in the future, they would have to prove at the time of approval that, they, that there was no expectation of profitability. Um, let me just give an example. So it turns out that one of the other, I've mentioned that there were three uh, designations in the history of the Orphan Drug Act under the cost recovery prong. One of, one of the other ones is Suboxone, um, which was also designated in 1994 also um, for the company Reckitt Bankieser, which is now, uh, which uh, NDVR of spun off from in 2014. And it's so, important to note that this was pre the opioid crisis. This is correct, That's yes, that is absolutely correct. Um, and so what the, with the loophole as is, in theory, Indivior could develop a new formulation of Suboxone, which is, uh, I think, the best-selling buprenorphine drug in the world. Um, and automatically gain orphan status for that new formulation because um, essentially the designation uh, for, for Suboxone in 1994 would be automatically grandfathered. Um, so essentially that would just be a repeat of what, they, what the company did for right. Medicaid. And this bill would close that possibility. And it's only a small change. That's right. It's only a small change and it's obviously a necessary change. So again, I wanna thank you because uh, this is extremely important, and, and I just appreciate you being here, appreciate your testimony. Dr. Allen, I want to ask you, under the Modern Labeling Act, um, who, the updates, if there are updates to a, to a label of a drug, who is to communicate that to the doctor and to the pharmacist? Whose responsibility? Is it FDA, or is it manufacturer, or who? So... Uh Generally speaking, that information would be first listed in, in the label, which would allow it to be the basis of communication. So FDA would communicate via the label that would be accessible to uh, the prescriber. Um, and it, for the information that is in the label, that could then be actively communicated um, by the manufacturer. With, with all due respect, I didn't just start reading the label to see if anything had changed. I mean, somebody needs to notify the pharmacist, somebody needs to notify the doctor that a labeling change has been made. Whose responsibility is that? And I think in, in instances where it's a, where it's a safety concern, there's, a, there's more active mechanisms that that can be pushed out. Um, for some of these others, they may be more just a, a, a reference um, as opposed to uh, every modification that, um, that could occur to a drug over the, over the life cycle. You know, some of that may not even raise to um, the point of, uh, of a label change, um, for example, because I think the important thing that hasn't necessarily been mentioned in our discussions today around this bill is the standards for the information that would be put in the label here would be consistent with current law that's been in place for decades. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if there's a new indication for a drug, it's going to be communicated most probably by the manufacturer. I mean, they're, they're going to want the, the physician and the pharmacist to know there's a new indication for this. 
if it's if it's updated in the label. If right. it's supported in scientific evidence, there may be limitations in terms of how they might be able to communicate it. Okay. Um, Mr. Kaiser, I wanted to ask you um, regarding counterfeit m medical devices. This is obviously, some, obviously something that has evolved over time. And is it, is it getting more detailed? Is it getting more um, complex as, as time goes on? From what I've seen, uh, counterfeiting is evolving. I, I do believe that they are getting better at what they do, which is really forcing our hand to get better at what we do. So the short answer is yes. And, and you know, I want to just um, issue a warning. As we talk about prescription drug prices and how we're going to control those prices and, and we open up markets outside of the United States, uh, this is a very big concern of mine. I've uh, in my years of practicing pharmacy, I've had people bring products to me. I got this through the mail. Is this the right thing? And and it, you know, I mean, I don't I don't have laboratory there that I can ascertain whether it is or not. So I just think there's a big warning there that we need to all heed to. So thank you very much. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. A pleasure to recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you very much for holding today's legislative hearing and including my bipartisan legislation, the Safeguarding Therapeutics Act, which I drafted with my friend Congressman uh, Guthrie. Um, counterfeit drugs and uh, medical devices pose a significant health risk to the American public, which can lead to serious patient harm or even death. Just last November, the DEA reported that 27 percent of the counterfeit pills it had seized contained potentially lethal doses of fentanyl. Since 2008, the FDA has frequently participated in an international initiative known as Operation Pangea to prevent the sale of counterfeit health care products. The Safeguarding Therapeutics Act provides the FDA with another tool to protect Americans from counterfeit medical products. Specifically, this bipartisan legislation provides the FDA with the authority to destroy counterfeit medical devices. Chairwoman Eshoo, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit into the record a letter of support for H.R. 5663 from the Healthcare Supply Chain Association. So ordered. Thank you. Mr. Kayser, thank you for joining us today and sharing your insights on protecting the healthcare supply chain from unscrupulous actors. I know or much earlier in the testimony you, you mentioned to it. In your written testimony, you share a recent example of how a counterfeit version of J&J's medical device known as Surgicel, which is critical to controlling patient, uh, bleeding during and after surgery, nearly ended up in patient care. M Mr. Kayser, how did this product end up in the supply chain, and what steps can policymakers take to educate healthcare providers and patients about counterfeit medical products? Representative Engel, first of all, thank you very much for your sponsorship of this bill. It's very important. Um, going back to the example with Surgicel, uh, the counterfeit Surgicel uh, was manufactured in India, went through a distributor in the Middle East and do, based in Dubai, and eventually landed in three distributors in, in Florida. So um, best uh, per our investigation, uh, these distributors contact hospitals offering lower cost um, Johnson & Johnson products, and, and they took the bait. So it was through an unauthorized gray market distributor is how they acquired that. Well, well, thank you very much, and, and thanks for, uh, for helping us to uh, expose it. Uh, Dr. Uh, Muzio, uh, let me um, say this. Um, I'm going to talk about drug shortages, which is certainly a priority for the New York hospitals. Uh, drug shortages can hamper patient care and that they, they delay, obviously, medical procedures or lead to the substitution of recommended treatments with alternative therapies. And these shortages have increased in recent years, putting an unnecessary burden on safety net hospitals in my home state of New York. In September, I led a bipartisan letter with Congressman Guthrie, signed by over 90 House members, to the FDA, which prompted the agency to release a report on approaches to reduce drug shortages. And I also want to thank Chairman Pallone for supporting us on this issue. His bill, the National Centers for Excellence 
and Continuous Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Act, which I have co-sponsored, would expand federal support for a promising technology that could help address drug shortages. So, Dr. Muzio, could you describe how continuous manufacturing is more expeditious in responding to drug shortages than traditional batch manufacturing? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Congressman, for your co-sponsorship of the bill. So when you have to develop a product or a process using batch manufacturing, typically you have to make a full batch of product many times over to obtain the information needed to figure out what are the right parameters to make the product. You make each of those batches under different conditions, and from that you determine how to make the product going forward. So each time in batch, you end up making a full batch. Or you make a small scale batch and then you have to do scale up studies to be able to then implement the process at the full scale. This takes many weeks, sometimes months. In continuous manufacturing, you are feeding your ingredients to a system that turns those ingredients into finished products in a man manner of minutes. And if you want to explore many conditions, you modify your settings and every 10 or 15 minutes you have a full new experiment. So the entire large set of experiments that you need to do to find the right way to make the product or the process takes a day or two. Even if you want to repeat your studies, all you end up needing is a few weeks at the most. So the intrinsic nature of continuous processes is much faster. One more thing that is important, as you do those experiments, you're collecting information about what the process is doing every second. So you have much more information about how those experiments tell you how to implement the process. And as a result, you can implement a new process and find the right conditions much more quickly. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to everybody on the panel. It's been really uh, very enlightening and interesting. And thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Engel. And I know you waited a long time to, be, um, uh, to speak and appreciate the good words that you've uh, um, both your questions and the good words about uh, the excellent witnesses. Uh, pleasure to recognize um, uh, the gentleman and my pal from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for his five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I see my, my colleague from Illinois has been also waiting patiently, Ms. Schakowsky. He's waving on, though. Okay. I'm going to yield back my time. I appreciate you all being here. Okay. Moving right along. Uh, I recognize the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, who is... Uh, waving on to the subcommittee. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I thank you for the opportunity once again to wave on to um, this, uh, this committee. I, I heard what you said to um, Congressman Welch about the relevance of some of the questions um, for, for this panel, which is an excellent panel. Um, I do want to raise uh, another issue, but I do also want to connect it um, to Johnson & Johnson and uh, Mr. Um, Kayser's um, presence here, here today. I do want to um, tell you that on December 10th, um, 2010, um, <coughs> Representative Presley and I sent a letter to the CEO at Johnson & John Johnson, Alex Gors uh, Gorski, um, about the targeted marketing and sale of your talc-based um, baby powder and its uh, potential to cause harm, particularly to women and girls of color due to asbestos contamination. I don't know if you're familiar with that letter at all, Mr. Kayser. Yeah, I didn't expect so. Um, in 2006, Johnson & Johnson's talc um, supplier warned the company that perineal, uh, perineal use of talc could be um, possibly carcin carcinogenic. Um, that information actually didn't get passed on. Um, to consumers, and instead there was a multicultural marketing campaign um, for your baby powder um, targeted to black and Latino women. Um, the, uh, the response letter that I got didn't come from the um, uh, chairman of the company, and I actually am now seeking a, a, a meeting. Um, and I, um, I would like to um, have permission to um, enter in the record, Madam Chair, um, the um, uh, 2010, 2019 Reuters article that revealed that Sri Lanka 
um, halted imports of Johnson & Johnson baby powder until they can prove the product is free from cancer causing asbestos. And this is where I get to the issue of importing and also exporting. Um, um, I, I wonder if you were aware, Mr. Kayser, yes or no, um, do Sri Lankan sales of your baby powder, have they fallen under um, the, um, under your job, D does that fall under your job description at all? That does not fall under my job description. Well, l let me just say, let me just say this. We're concerned about counterfeit drugs coming into, and, and um, medical devices coming into the United States. But I think it's worth pointing out that other countries are afraid of importing a Johnson & Johnson product um, uh, that uh, may contain, that do contain um, asbestos con contaminated baby powder. But I guess you're saying this is not something under your jurisdiction. That's correct. Yeah, well, I certainly hope that the company will take this seriously, even as it looks at um, imports, that it ought to look at the question of import exports and the concern that other countries have with products that are made by, by Johnson & Johnson. Um, I'd also like, Madam Chair, if I can, to um, enter into the record um, my letter to Johnson & Johnson um, and the response that we received from J&J's consulting firm, um, including documents that revealed that Johnson & Johnson um, uh, partnered with a manufacturing um, agency that specialized in, quote, ethnic, cons uh, ethnic consumers, unquote, to distribute 100,000 gift bags containing baby powder and other Johnson & Johnson baby products in black and Hispanic communities and neighborhoods in Chicago, and that J&J &J launched a uh, campaign to boost sales of baby, baby powder to, quote, curvy southern women, 18 to 49, skewed African-American, unquote. Um, that increased sales by, by 9%. Um, and so I think that when we're talking about the problem of uh, these kinds of drugs coming into the country, these counterfeits, it's very important. I appreciate the, uh, the, the work that you're doing, but we also have to consider what's being marketed to Americans and exported to other countries that don't want that product. Thank you. I yield back. Was the gentlewoman asking for something to be placed in the record? I am. And I mentioned you just said what they were. Yes. The, the letters? Yes. Yes. Le letters so, and some other. And documents. the newspaper article. Without newspaper article. Without, article without objection. And other documents. Thank without you. Without objection. I, I want to be clear about something that I said earlier. And uh, 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 this committee has uh, always, um, I think, really conducted itself with a great deal of respect. Uh, to our witnesses, whether we agree or disagree uh, with um, uh, maybe the company's policy, uh, what we want to do in the Congress, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't badger witnesses. And that was my point this morning. Um, so I appreciate the gentlewoman coming and raising what she wished to raise. Uh, uh, but I want it to be very clear uh, why I spoke up relative to Mr. Kaiser uh, and um, I think what I said earlier stands, and I stand by it. We don't badger witnesses. So thank you. Uh, so I think this concludes this, um, uh, the work of this panel and its witnesses. I think you've been outstanding uh, uh, answering the questions and uh, uh, helping us to um, uh, uh, understand different parts of the policies that are being advanced, how they will uh, really benefit the American people. Dr. Muzio, I want to particularly follow up with you relative to the um, uh, continuous manufacturing because uh, we have a big job to do to uh, what I think is a necessity, and that's overhaul uh, our country's drug supply. So thank you to each one of you for giving your time, your professionalism, your expertise, your 
uh, considerable intellect on each of the uh, of the bills uh, that we were considering, and uh, we'll ask. Uh, uh, you can now be excused, and I uh, would ask the uh, staff to prepare the witness table for the next um, panel, panel two. Thank you again. Thank you. You've been Thank absolutely you. terrific. Myself. My name is David. I'm also Hi. from the University of Michigan. Oh, yeah, you are? Yes. Uh, do you mind if I get a couple pictures of you real quick oh, sure. so we can feature? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we have that picture. We have a really good picture too that we got from the webcast. Oh, good. I was trying to take it from the TV. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. Kara found one. She was live streaming it on her phone. Oh, I think it's. Really, so I'll send it to you and Moira. Because yeah. I know if Moira was interested too. Please do. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. But if you want to come up, I think there's a placard yes, for Senate committee. Let's go see if you want to do that. Sure. Just for yourself too. I'll send them to you, obviously. Too. We'll get we'll get you to send. One just took. I actually yeah, want to follow up with uh, Representative Welch. Oh, you do? Okay. Because he's, like, I'm doing research that's directly relevant to the question he asked me, but I didn't want to go on that ground. So. Oh, okay. Is he still here? Oh, it looks okay. like he lost his wallet. Okay. <laughs> I didn't expect well, that. Want... I did not expect that question. Yeah. I had to say no. I did not expect that question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, yes, I would. Actually, okay. um, um, can I get home? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then also the representative. Uh, right over.
Okay, can we get the witnesses seated at the table, please? Wow, look at how many. All right, so we have the majority of the witnesses seated. Um, we're now going to hear from the uh, second panel of witnesses on, um, on the important issues that we're taking up today. These, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the bills that we're dealing with now center in and around food and FDA. And uh, uh, so welcome to each one of you. I think I recognize you because most of you have been um, sitting and waiting patiently, but I, I'm sure that you, um, you enjoyed the testimony from the first panel too, because we're all learning together. Uh, so welcome, uh, we have Ms. Talia Day, a patient, where, where am I, am I not, there you are. Someone's hair down there is in the way, who's that? There you are, why are you on the floor like that? Oh, you have a camera, I see. Uh, Ms. Talia Day. Welcome to you. She's a patient advocate with the Food Allergy Research and Education Group, uh, sometimes known uh, by uh, the word FAIR, F-A-R-E. Uh, our, uh, our next witness, I can't see because we've got the water jug there. I think it's Sarah. Is it Sarah? Um, Sarah Sorcher, uh, Deputy Director, oh, I'm sorry, of Regulatory <laughs> Fair Center for Science and the Public Interest. I skipped over Mr. Carlin, I apologize. Mr. David Carlin, Senior Vice President of Legislative Affairs and Economic Policy with the International Dairy Foods Association. Welcome to you this afternoon. Uh, Ms. Nancy Perry, welcome to you. Uh, uh, she is Senior Vice President, Government Relations, American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Welcome to you. Thank you for the work of your organization, Dr. Douglas Corey, welcome to you. Past President, American Association of uh, Equine uh, Practitioners, Mr. Tom Balmer, welcome to you. Executive Vice President, National Milk Producers Federation. I want you to know I love milk. I really do. I loved that ad, you know, with the, mm. uh, Ms. Melanie Benish, Legislative Attorney, Environmental Working Group, thank you, welcome to you. Uh, Dr. Paul DeLeo, Principal in Integral uh, Consulting, Inc. And where is um, Ms. Mountford? Is not here? Anyone know about Ms. Mountford? We're checking. Okay, we're checking. At any rate, um, we hope that she will be here she, because she's the president of, infant of the Infant Nutrition Council of America. So thank you to each one of you. We have a very full, wonderful, uh, panel, and uh, we'll begin with uh, Ms. Day. Uh, you have five minutes for your uh, testimony. Thank you. Chairwoman Eshu, Ranking Member Burgess, and members of the subcommittee, my name is Talia Day, and all three of my children have severe food allergies, including to sesame. I want to thank you for the opportunity to explain why the FASTER Act will have an enormous and positive impact on 32 million Americans living with food allergies and their families. These allergies are not only life-threatening, they are life-altering. My son, Zachary, was diagnosed with several severe food allergies in infancy. When he was just three years old, Zachary ingested dairy at school and had an anaphylactic reaction. Let me tell you in simple terms what this means. Almost instantly, his blood pressure began to drop, his throat began to close, and he struggled to breathe. His eyes and face began to swell. 
Luckily, epinephrine was promptly administered and Zachary recovered. I wish I could say this only happened once and that since then we've been able to avoid his allergens, but I cannot. Since then, Zachary has had multiple anaphylactic reactions, each one landing us in the emergency room, not knowing whether he would live or die, and paralyzing me with overwhelming fear and anxiety. Just this last summer, Zachary, now 10 years old, was off to summer camp. We did everything we are supposed to do as parents of a child with life-threatening food allergies. We met with camp directors and staff, we provided detailed written instructions around his dietary limitations. We supplied substitute foods and epinephrine auto injectors. None of that mattered though, because due to a simple oversight, pure human <coughs> error, Zachary was given the wrong food one afternoon, sending him into his worst anaphylactic episode to date. The situation was so dire, we thought the unthinkable his food allergies were going to cost him his life. We would lose our son to something that should be preventable. While most parents who send their child to camp or school worry about homesickness or scrapes on the playground, our reality is different. Our greatest fear is that he will be accidentally exposed to sesame or one of his other allergens and not come home at all. This is our reality every single day. As I mentioned, 32 million Americans have food allergies, with a rise of nearly 400% in the number of hospitalizations for food allergies from just 2007 to 2016. One in 13 children have a life-threatening food allergy. That is roughly two children in every classroom. The trend is frightening. Imagine how many people in the next generation could be at risk. We need to do more. Today, sesame remains the most common allergen that is not required to be written on food labels and is often hidden on labels as spices or natural flavors. How are parents, schools, and other caretakers supposed to keep children like Zachary safe if companies aren't even required to label for their allergens? Nearly 1.5 million Americans are allergic to sesame. When you consider this combined with the rapid increase in overall food allergies, it's clear we must act now. We are thankful for organizations like FAIR, who advocate on behalf of the food allergy community, and Congresswoman Matsui for introducing this important legislation. HR 2117 stands to drastically improve our day-to-day -day lives and change our reality. If passed, it will require the federal government to gather comprehensive information about who has food allergies, the kind of food allergies they have, and what types of food allergies occur most often. Further, it will update allergen labeling laws to include sesame, and it would require labeling standards for additional allergens as new scientific evidence emerges. We need this. For me, for my family, and for families all over the country, in every state and district. Now is the time to pass the FASTER Act. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Day, for um, your powerful testimony. Uh, it's now a pleasure to recognize Mr. Carlin. You have five minutes for yours. Chairwoman Eshoo, uh, Mr. Shimkus, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify at today's hearing in support of the Codifying Useful Regulatory Definitions Act, which would define the term natural cheese in federal statute. My name is David Carlin, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Legislative Affairs and Economic Policy at the International Dairy Foods Association, which represents the nation's dairy manufacturing and marketing industry. U.S. cheesemakers have used the term natural cheese for more than 70 years to describe a particular category of cheese and to differentiate it from processed cheese in the supermarket. Natural cheeses are made directly from milk, while processed cheese is made by combining various natural cheeses to achieve certain characteristics desired by consumers, such as how well a cheese will melt. Consumers know that a natural cheese like cheddar or avarti would be appropriate to serve at a social function and that processed cheese is perfect for making a grilled cheese sandwich. The term natural cheese has also been used extensively over the several decades by FDA, USDA, 
Congress and the courts to describe a particular category of cheese. Unfortunately, the ability of U.S. cheesemakers to continue to use the term natural cheese on their packaging is now threatened. Four years ago, the FDA initiated a separate process to define how the term natural may be used to make product claims, such as 100 percent natural or all natural. Even though the term natural cheese is not a product claim and is only used to define a particular category of cheese, U.S. cheesemakers find themselves caught up in an unrelated policy debate that could force them to change decades' worth of labeling practices that generations of consumers have come to rely on when choosing the right cheese for every occasion. Defining the term natural cheese in statute will clarify its specific meaning and narrow the scope of FDA's work so that it can focus on how the term natural may be used to make product claims. I would also like to note that FDA's technical experts have reviewed the CURD Act extensively over the past two years and all of their substantive comments have been addressed by the bill's sponsors. On behalf of our cheesemaking members, I would like to express our sincere appreciation for FDA's careful review and extensive input regarding this legislation. The CURD Act is strongly supported by natural and processed cheesemakers and by the National Milk Federation, Producers Federation, which represents dairy farmer cooperatives. I would also like to use the, re the rest of my time to address some of the misconceptions regarding this legislation. First, this would not be the first time that Congress has acted to define a dairy term or a type of food in federal statute. Definitions of butter and nonfat dry milk are already included in the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Congress also passed legislation in 2002 that added definitions of ginseng and catfish to the act. Second, the CURD Act does not change in any way the ingredients that may be used to make standard and non-standardized cheeses. In other words, if a cheesemaker was permitted to use a particular ingredient to make a standardized cheese before this bill is enacted, the cheesemaker will still be able to use that same ingredient after enactment of this bill. Conversely, if a particular ingredient was not permitted to be used before, it would not be permitted to be used after enactment. Third, the CURD Act does not change FDA's policy on the use of the term natural or all natural claims, and it does not establish a product-specific definition of natural. The bill would simply codify a definition of natural cheese as a category of cheese. It does not define the term natural with respect to product claims. As stated earlier, Section 3 of the bill contains language that explicitly states that any cheese that makes a product claim, such as 100 percent natural or all natural, must continue to comply with FDA's current regulations regarding those terms. Finally, the CURD Act would not in any way create an inconsistency between FDA and USDA regarding the use of natural claims on labels. As members of this subcommittee well know, FDA regulates most food products, including cheese, while USDA regulates meat, poultry, and certain egg products. Therefore, USDA's definition of natural only applies to those meat, poultry, and egg products that fall under its jurisdiction. FDA regulates cheese, and accordingly, the only definition of natural that is relevant to this discussion is FDA's definition of that term. As stated previously, even if this bill is enacted, U.S. cheesemakers will continue to be required to comply with FDA's current policy and any future regulations governing the use of the term natural for product claim purposes. By preserving our industry's ability to use the term natural cheese to describe a category of cheese, the CURD Act would ensure continued clarity in the marketplace for consumers and codify the historical regulatory use of the term by both FDA and USDA. Thank you for inviting me to participate in today's hearing, and I look forward to answering questions from members of the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Carlin. Uh, Ms. Sorcher, you are recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Chairwoman Eshoo, um, Ranking Member Burgess, and members of the committee. Um, I'm pleased to testify today on behalf of Center for Science and the Public Interest, uh, America's Food and Health Watchdog. Since 1971, CSPI has represented consumers in advocating for a safer, healthier food system and has played a major role in pushing for laws governing food labeling, including the Nutrition Facts Panel, menu labeling, and uh, allergen labeling. Our work is funded by individual subscribers to our Nutrition Action Health Letter and donations from individuals and foundations. We do not accept donations from corporations or government grants, allowing us to serve as an independent voice for consumers. I'll speak today primarily on two bills that would impact food labeling, the FASTER Act and the CURD Act. 
CSPI supports the FASTER Act, uh, which among other things would update the li U.S. list of major allergens to include sesame. When Congress passed uh, FALCPA in 2004, it created an important new requirement for labeling the so-called major food allergens, which were the eight most common allergens that had been identified at the time. The law also authorized FDA to label additional non-major allergens through separate regulations. In 2014, CSPI was the first group to urge FDA to make use of that new authority by petitioning the agency for sesame allergen labeling. Recent studies have shown that sesame allergy is similar in prevalence and greater in severity than some of the big eight major food allergens required to be labeled. Importantly, a greater fraction of adults with sesame allergy report having an ER visit in the past year than adults with any other major food allergy, um, illustrating how difficult it is even for adults to avoid undeclared sesame in foods. In addition, in, in 2018, uh, CSPI reported that a majority of 22 large food companies that we surveyed had, or were already voluntarily labeling for sesame, and more indicated that they could easily do so if given clear direction from regulators. FDA opened a docket to collect data on sesame labeling in 2018, but it's taken no further action since that docket closed in December of that year. Given the clear and urgent need for sesame labeling and ongoing delay by the agency, we urge Congress to add sesame to the list of major allergens through legislation. CSPI opposes the Curd Act, um, as this bill would confuse consumers by defining uh, as natural any cheese product that does not meet the narrow regulatory definition of processed cheese. The ostensible purpose of the bill is to draw a clear line for consumers by defining processed cheese and differentiating it from natural cheese. Yet processed cheese is already clearly labeled as such, and there is no evidence that manufacturers are currently misrepresenting that such products are natural. Instead of protecting consumer interests, the bill addresses the interests of cheese manufacturers who wish to be sheltered from litigation by consumers, alleging that they were misled by natural claims on cheeses that contain artificial ingredients. For example, in 2016, Kraft was sued for natural cheeses alleged to contain artificial coloring. Uh, more recently, Sargento was sued based on feeding and rearing practices for the cows that produce the milk for its line of natural cheeses. CSPI is not involved in either of these cases and has not taken a position on the litigation, but we do oppose any legislative effort to distort the meaning of natural for the purpose of denying consumers their day in court. While traditional uh, cheese making involves only a few ingredients, high quality milk, salt, and cultures, the cheese industry today employs a host of novel processes and additives that can cut the time and expense required to produce cheese. These novel ingredients are not necessarily reviewed for safety by the FDA, which permits companies to self-certify new ingredients as generally recognized as safe without even notifying the agency or making safety data available to the public. Mm -hmm. Certain artificial ingredients are also expressly legally permitted under the standards of identity for cheese. For example, artificial coloring is expressly allowed in many standardized cheeses. While legally permitted, many American consumers would not consider these cheeses to be natural. For example, a nationally representative telephone survey conducted in May 2018 by Consumer Reports found that more than 80% of consumers say natural should mean no artificial ingredients were used. That's why the USDA permits the term natural only on products containing no artificial ingredients or added color and that are only minimally processed. FDA is also currently working on a definition of natural that ideally will be non-misleading and apply uniformly across all FDA-regulated foods. The Curd Act would seek to short-circuit that process by carving out a special definition for natural that would only apply to cheese and run counter to consumer expectations. Um, finally, because the Curd Act also defines milk as lacteal secretions from an animal, it could be interpreted to, to prohibit the use of the term natural on non-dairy alternatives eaten by consumers who are vegan, allergic to milk, or otherwise wish to avoid dairy cheeses. Use of the term natural should not be prohibited on these products, provided the products otherwise meet consumer expectations for that food. So we therefore urge Congress not to act prematurely and define natural cheese in a way that will con confuse consumers and make the rule inconsistent with other labeling. Thank you for your testimony. And now, pleasure to recognize uh, Ms. Perry for your five minutes of questioning. Thank you. Chairwoman Eshoo, Congressman Shimkus, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to offer our support for the SAFE Act to end horse slaughter. The American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals is a leading voice for animal welfare as the very first humane organization established on this continent in 1866. We strongly support the Safeguard American Food Exports Act as a critical missing link 
in the existing systems vital for protecting American equines. It has 225 bipartisan House co-sponsors and every major animal welfare organization, along with 80% of the American public who support it. The ASPCA believes horse slaughter presents serious food safety concerns, is a primary obstacle to achieve equine welfare by interfering with and depriving horses of good homes, and is itself a form of serious equine cruelty. Congress has effectively banned horse slaughter since 2007 in annual spending bills with strong bipartisan support. Both Presidents Obama and Trump requested this ban in their budgets. Unfortunately, a loophole that still allows tens of thousands of American horses to be shipped over our borders for slaughter. The SAFE Act will close this loophole to protect our horses as well as human health. Horse meat is unsafe. Horses are not raised for food in the US, and those who wind up at slaughter are not unwanted, but rather unlucky during career shifts from racetracks, riding camps, show barns, and ranches. They don't come from a setting where anyone ever expected they might become food. Veterinarians, owners, and trainers regularly administer myriad therapeutic treatments during daily horse care, many of which are expressly banned by the FDA for use on animals for human consumption. Since horses are not raised for food, we don't track any of these treatments, and horses change hands on average eight times throughout their lives, so it would be nearly impossible to do. In contrast, animals raised in our food system are closely tracked, fed approved feed, and are given approved drugs from birth to death. The FDA routinely visits farms enforcing its regulations when animals are given prohibited substances or even if records are inadequate or missing. Phenylbutazone, or bute, is one of the most prevalent drugs given to horses and the most toxic to humans. This carcinogen induces blood dyscrasias as well as hypersensitivity reaction in the liver, which can cause renal failure and death. Due to its idiosyncratic health risk to humans, Butte is only approved for use in dogs and horses. In FDA's own words, there are currently no approved uses of Butte in food producing animals. Also, there are no safe residue levels and no withdrawal periods for Butte. We've provided the committee with a list of more than 100 banned and dangerous substances commonly given to horses, including dewormers, fly sprays, hoof hardeners, tranquilizers, hormone regulators, and anesthetics that are carcinogens or cause developmental issues in children, cardiovascular illness, or hormone-dependent cancers. FDA banned these drugs for consumption because they are toxic and should not be present in any concentration in our food. Suggesting that we should send known toxic meat to other countries and export this obvious public health risk is irresponsible. The good news is that the number of American horses shipped to slaughter is actually declining down to under 62,000 from over 100,000 in recent years. And welfare organizations and rehoming programs with industry engagement are at an all-time high. However, without a ban, we actually incentivize slaughter instead of rescue and compromise equine welfare. Kill buyers bid against and outbid good homes at auctions, squandering resources by predatorily driving up prices. Even more insidious, these kill buyers then hold online auctions seeking ransoms for horses they would ship to slaughter, taking advantage of the public while competing with our rescuers. The ASPCA has compelling evidence now that horse slaughter actually causes neglect more than 70% of owners surrendering horses to our support centers report keeping horses past the point of good care because they so feared their horse would end up at slaughter. Horse slaughter is equine cruelty. These animals are not suited for this purpose due to their physiology, their flight response, and the slaughterhouse equipment for stunning. We support humane euthanasia for horses when quality of life is impaired, but slaughter is not euthanasia. Americans overwhelmingly oppose the slaughter of horses. It's a public health risk that we shouldn't be exporting to our neighbors. It's time to close this loophole, and I thank Representative Schakowsky and Buchanan for leading a bipartisan effort to pass the SAFE Act. Thank you. Thank you. We haven't had any lunch here, but I just <laughs> lost my appetite. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Let's pass. Uh, thank you, Ms. Perry. Uh, Dr. Corey, it's a pleasure to recognize uh, you for your five you. minutes of testimony. Uh, Chair Eshoo and, and Ranking Member Burgess and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear here today. My name is Dr. Douglas Corey, and I've been an equine veterinarian for more than 40 years. I'm here today not only as a longtime horse owner, but also as a past president of the American Association of Equine Practitioners, a professional association which represents the vast ma majority of equine veterinarians in the country. I've served as chair of the uh, AAP's Equine Welfare Committee, the American Veterinary Medicals Association Animal Welfare Committee, and the Unwanted Horse Coalition. I also serve on the American Horse Council Welfare Committee. There is little evidence that shows consuming equine meat from horses raised in the United States poses a threat to public health. Each country accepting horse meat is responsible to ensure that the product is safe for citizens to consume. As an example, horses being transported to Canada for processing must be held in hold holding facilities for six months to ensure there are no medication residues. Additionally, the meat of horses processed in Mexico and Canada is tested for drug residues, heavy metals, bacterial contamination, exactly like what is done with beef, pork, sheep. And in addition, the European Union has its own regulations regarding drug residues and horse meat. Our primary concern is this bill will negatively impact the health and welfare of horses across the country and offers no solution to the problem of the unwanted horse. The unwanted horse represents a group of horses within the domestic equine population that are no longer wanted, needful, or useful, or their owners are no longer interested in them or are not financially able to provide the horse with appropriate care. Our chief welfare concerns in the bill are, number one, the long-term placement of these unwanted horses. It is estimated that there are approximately 80 to 100,000 horses are transported to Canada and Mexico for processing annually. The proponents of the legislation suggest that these additional horses will be absorbed by the alternative homes, the rescues, and retirement facilities. However, these options are already under stress and overcrowded. With a life expectancy of 20 to 30 years, there will be, um, where will the additional facilities and funding come from to care for these animals? In addition, many of the individuals who adopt horses are often unprepared for the cost to adopt and provide proper care and feeding for a horse. While many of these people are well-intentioned, the sad fact is that without proper resources, many of these horses are headed for a much worse fate of starvation, neglect, and abandonment. It would be nice to absorb every unwanted horse into the equine society, but as history has proven, there simply are not enough people with the desire, the means, and the knowledge, and or assets available to respond to the need. Two, the bill does not address the funding required for the care of these additional horses. To provide a horse's basic needs, the funding needed for one year per horse is approximately $1,800. Inadequate funding often leads to inadequate care. Third, in regards to the bill itself, it will not stop the transportation of horses for other reasons, such as sporting events, sales, recreation. Once they cross the border, this language would not stop horses from being processed. The AAP partners with a number of equine welfare organizations that have enhanced efforts and outreach to improve rescue, retirement, and rehoming facilities, promoted more adoptions, and offer a safety net of programs for owners in need, including stallion castrations, euthanasia, and disposal assistance. As you can, as you can see, this industry is coming together to address the problem, and we are pleased that this concerted effort is reducing the number of unwanted horses. The AAP believes that processing is not the ideal solution for addressing the large number of unwanted horses. However, if a horse owner is, no, is unable or unwilling to provide humane care and no one can assume that responsibility, humane euthanasia at a processing facility in accordance with AVMA's euthanasia guidelines is an acceptable alternative to a life of starvation, neglect, or abuse. In summary, we all must work together to address the root cause of this unwanted horse. We need proactive solutions and believe that the AAP and equine welfare advocates are developing these solutions that will continue to help decrease the number of unwanted horses. 
However, and most importantly, supporting this bill will not improve the welfare of the horse. Thank you for, for the opportunity to address you today, and I'd be happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Corey. Mr. Balmer, you're now recognized for your five minutes of testimony, and thank you. Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Burgess, members of the subcommittee, my name is Tom Balmer, and I serve as Executive Vice President of the National Milk Producers Federation, the voice of America's dairy cooperatives and their farmer owners for over 100 years. I thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Dairy Pride Act, a bipartisan bill intended to finally enforce, or excuse me, to finally compel FDA to enforce its existing standards of identity for dairy products. Mr. Welch, we commend you for introducing this legislation and thank your co-author, Mr. Simpson, and many others for their support. We also commend Senator Baldwin and Risch for authoring this measure in the Senate. At its core, the Dairy Pride Act would ensure the accurate and appropriate labeling of non-dairy foods that use standardized dairy terms an issue with significant implications for consumers. Federal standards of identity were established to promote honesty and fair dealing in the interests of consumers by promulgating reasonable definitions for food products. These defined terms have come to carry distinct meanings in the minds of consumers. Dairy farmers work hard to make products that are wholesome, nutritious, and in compliance with these standards. However, for decades, the FDA has been negligent in their enforcement, particularly with respect to the clear requirement that a product labeled as milk or yogurt, for example, originates from cows and other lactating food animals. Unfortunately, grocery stores today are filled with copycat products that flout these long-established standards of identity and mislead consumers about their nutritional equivalents with real dairy products. Real milk is a nutritional powerhouse. It's full of numerous vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients essential to human health. Milk is the number one source of nine nutrients in children's diets, including potassium, calcium, and vitamin D. According to the 2015 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, these are three of the four nutrients of public health concern. These guidelines also recognize that most plant-based imitation milk products are not nutritionally equivalent to milk. Plant-based food processors like to use terms such as milk on their products in a blatant attempt to trade on the health halo and other positive attributes of the real thing. The widespread marketing of these imitation products has created an abundance of consumer confusion. Evidence shows that consumers think that plant-based products are nutritionally equal to or better than those from cow's milk. An Ipsos survey conducted in 2018 found that 73% of consumers surveyed believe that almond-based beverages have as much or more protein than a serving of milk. In reality, milk has up to eight times as much protein per serving. The 2015 Dietary Guidelines also found that most Americans don't meet the recommended intake for dairy. The upshot of this is that there are real consequences to a drop in the intake of nutrients that dairy provides. Recognizing this, four leading health groups, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Heart Association, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry issued a report last fall urging that young children not be fed most plant-based imitation products in place of cow's milk, as their nutrition profiles are largely not equivalent to real milk. My organization has repeatedly raised concerns with FDA regarding its failure to enforce the law. We were encouraged when former Commissioner Gottlieb announced in 2018 that FDA would finally look at this issue. During the FDA's review process, multiple health stakeholders voiced concerns about consumers not grasping the nutritional differences between real dairy products and imitators. Although we were helpful, hope, excuse me, though we were hopeful that FDA would finally act, their timeline has continually shifted with no endpoint in sight. Unless Congress acts, FDA's follow-through remains uncertain. That's why we are encouraged that the Dairy Pride Act is included in today's hearing. The bill is not complicated. It simply directs FDA to promptly explain how it will enforce existing standards of identity for milk and other dairy foods. It would also require foods that use standardized dairy terms inappropriately to be considered misbranded under the law and subject to enforcement. Speaking of misbranded, I would be remiss if I did not point out that imitation dairy products labeled as plant butter are currently in the marketplace and are in violation of the statutory definition of butter established by the Butter Act of 1923. In past years, FDA has stated that any product that used the term butter and does not meet the enacted definition is misbranded. 
Nonetheless, the word butter is now being used to market imitation dairy products nation, excuse me, market imitation products nationwide. FDA's decision not to enforce the definition amounts, in effect, to an agency rewriting an act of Congress. I point this out to underscore a widespread pattern of deception that can cause consumers to make well-intentioned but misguided purchasing decisions for themselves and their families. Madam Chair, I want to thank you once again for, and the ranking member for holding today's hearing. We appreciate the opportunity to testify and look forward to answering any questions members may have. Thank you, Mr. Balmer. I love hearings. I just learned so much from what everyone has to say. Uh, I now have the pleasure of um, recognizing Ms. Uh, is it Benesh or? Benesh. Benesh, uh, for your testimony. You have five minutes, and you can Thank proceed. Thank you for the opportunity mm -hmm. to testify. Welcome. PFAS chemicals are in the blood of virtually every living being and have been linked to serious health threats, including kidney and testicular cancer, reproductive harms like lower sperm counts and lower birth weights, developmental harms like altered mammary gland development, and even immunotoxic effects like reduced effectiveness of vaccines. When released into the environment, PFAS chemicals stay there forever. The Environmental Working Group has identified nearly 1,400 communities with contaminated water. But unless you live in one of those highly contaminated communities, your primary source of PFAS exposure is actually from your food. PFAS gets into food in many ways, one of which is through migration from food packaging, like pizza boxes, sandwich wrappers, and microwave popcorn bags. Um, but PFAS also gets into food from PFAS in irrigation water or biosolids that are applied to farm fields that then build up in livestock, plants, um, and even in milk. Many PFAS chemicals were allowed for use in food packaging before FDA understood the risks. But chemical companies have also hid the risks of PFAS from FDA. DuPont and 3M have a long history of hiding the risks of, of hiding information about the toxic effects of PFAS from regulators like EPA and FDA. And some companies continue to hide the risks from FDA. More recently, between 2008 and 2016, Daikin, a Japanese company that makes PFAS chemicals, submitted applications to FDA for the use of a PFAS chemical in food packaging but withheld information from two of their own internal company studies that showed toxic effects to the liver and kidney. And FDA did approve those food contact notifications. And companies can also take advantage of a legal loophole in the law that allows them to use PFAS chemicals without any FDA review at all and without even notifying FDA. But FDA has also failed to protect us. FDA has known since at least 2005 that PFAS chemicals migrate from food packaging into food, but failed to take action until 2016, and only then after response from a petition from NGOs. When companies do submit a chemical to FDA for approval, either for use in food or food packaging, the law requires that industry show with reasonable certainty that that chemical is safe. But for PFAS chemicals, industry has consistently failed to meet that legal burden by failing to provide FDA with studies about the reproductive harms or immunotoxic effects from PFAS chemicals, even though we know that those health effects are associated with PFAS chemicals even at low doses. In turn, when FDA reviews those submissions, the law explicitly requires that FDA take into consideration the cumulative risks from chemicals like PFAS. That is, not only the PFAS that's in the food wrapper, um, but also your other exposures from PFAS in food, water, air, or other household products. And yet, FDA has consistently failed to provide that cumulative risk analysis. And in fact, FDA has not even established safety values to calculate what it considers to be a safe amount of PFAS in food. And yet, despite these glaring data gaps and the lack of scientific information, FDA has continued to authorize PFAS food contact substances. And these decisions were made through a process that involves no public involvement, or oversight, minimal transparency, and no clear way for consumers to challenge FDA's decisions. We cannot afford to wait and see if FDA will finally follow the law and properly review PFAS and food packaging. Given the risk posed by PFAS, Congress should take action to end non-essential uses like PFAS and food packaging. Cleaning up the legacy of PFAS pollution from polluters like DuPont, 3M, 
the Department of Defense and other bad actors who have been emitting PFAS and dumping PFAS into waterways for more than 50 years is a complex problem, and it will take decades to clean up that legacy pollution. But by contrast, eliminating a non-essential use, like PFAS and food packaging, is relatively simple. Congress can simply ban it and remove that source of exposure. This is an emergency. States and local governments have not been waiting for FDA to take action. Washington State banned PFAS and food packaging in 2018, and that uh, ban will take effect in 2022. The city of San Francisco has already implemented a ban on PFAS and food serviceware. Retailers like Giant, Food Lion, Stop and Shop, Panera, Taco Bell, McDonald's, Burger King are also not waiting for FDA to take action and have indicated that they're moving to alternatives. And Congress should not wait for FDA to take action either. We urge you to support H.R. 2827, the Keep Can Food Containers Safe from PFAS Act. And thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Dr. DeLeo, it's a pleasure to welcome you. You have five minutes for your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Eshoo, Representative Shimkus, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to speak before this subcommittee today. My name is Paul DeLeo, and I'm a principal at Integral Consulting, an international science and engineering consulting firm of 150 employees nationwide. I'm based in Annapolis, Maryland. <clears throat> I'm pleased to be here today to express my scientific opinion on H.R. 2827, the Keep Food Containers Safe from PFAS Act of 2019. However, I'd like to note that no client or any other entity has retained me to offer this position. I'm here today based on my firm's expertise with PFAS and my firsthand knowledge of the regulatory process for the safety assessment of food contact substances, having worked for six and a half years at the Food and Drug Administration in the office with those responsibilities. I testify here today in opposition of H.R. 2827 as unnecessary, overly broad, and contrary to the well-established scientific processes for the pre-market evaluation of the safety of chemicals in the United States. FDA has had the responsibility for the regulation of food additives since 1938. FDA has well-trained and highly dedicated staff who are fully capable of evaluating PFAS chemistries in, in food packaging. Prior to 2000, authorized uses of food contact substances, uh, FDA authorized uses of food contact substances through the food additive petition process. However, since 2000, FDA authorizes the use of food contact substances through the food contact notification program. According to FDA online databases, the current universe of regulated PFAS food contact substances is approximately 100 substances. This is a modest number of substances, all of which have been evaluated by FDA staff prior to being permitted to come to market as a food contact substance. There are substantial data requirements associated with the food contact notification program, and the agency has the authority to object to any notification if it does not believe the proposed use of the food contact substance is safe. In addition, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act gives the agency authority to require or accept submission of a food additive petition for the food contact substance in cases where it is necessary to provide adequate, uh, adequate assurance of safety of that substance. Once a food contact substance is on the market, FDA has the ability to track the safety of these chemicals and has a record of doing so for PFAS. For at least 15 years, scientists at FDA have been publishing peer-reviewed scientific papers regarding the potential for PFAS to migrate from food contact substances and the safety of those exposures. Moreover, FDA can revoke food contact authorizations when scientific data demonstrate that the authorized uses of a food contact substance are no longer safe or remove food contact substances from the market through voluntary agreements. Recently, FDA revoked several food contact authorization authorizations based on their abandonment by the manufacturer. H.R. 2827 is overly broad because it would apply to any PFAS used in food contact substances without consideration for its safety. For example, polymeric PFAS, also known as fluoropolymers, are not bioavailable or bioaccumulative, and they satisfy the widely accepted assessment criteria to be considered polymers of low concern around the globe. Therefore, they are considered to be of low hazard to human health and the environment. More importantly, the impacts of H.R. 2827 would be very broad because, although the number of individual PFAS food contact substances may be modest, PFAS have been safely used throughout the food supply in a variety of applications for decades. Therefore, it's not possible to predict the implications for food safety and the potential unintended consequences such legislation might precipitate. 
The rapid and broad changes would lead to disruption and confusion in the food industry and potentially compromise the safety of the U.S. food supply. Consumers in the U.S. benefit from a robust regulatory regime that requires new chemicals and new chemical applications to be evaluated for safety before they are permitted to be brought to the market. These pr programs have a long track record of success, and Congress has a long track record of successful oversight and reform when it is necessary to, to adapt those programs. The hallmark of safety regulation in the U.S. is a transparent, scientifically rigorous, risk-based process. The arbitrary declaration of an indeterminate number of PFAS applications as unsafe flies in the face of the track record of success of U.S. regulatory agencies and programs with unpredictable, potentially wide-reaching disruptive consequences. In conclusion, my recommendation to Congress would be, to the extent there is concern regarding PFAS, that it work closely with FDA to understand the safety of currently permitted uses of PFAS as food contact substances, to retrospectively analyze the assessment process, and to make sure that the agency has the tools and resources necessary to fully address PFAS as food contact substances. Thank you again for this opportunity to share my perspective. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, welcome to the table, Ms. Mountford. Glad you made it. Uh, you have five minutes to uh, present your testimony to us. And thank you again for being with us. Okay, you get, I'm on, okay. Good afternoon. Move it, move it closer so okay. we, we don't go. miss a word. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Marty Mountford, President of the Infant Nutrition Council of America, or INCA, and I appreciate the opportunity to address H.R. 2267, the Infant Formula Protection Act of 2019. INCA is an association representing manufacturers of infant formula who make over 95 percent of the formula fed in the United States. The primary focus of INCA and its member companies is and will always remain the health and welfare of infants and young children. That is why we share Congresswoman Ming's goal of preventing the purchase of infant formula that is past its use-by date, and we support the intent of H.R. 2267. Most babies in the United States receive infant formula, which is the only safe and medically recommended alternative to human breast milk, at some point during their first year of life. Most new moms initiate breastfeeding when their baby's born, but may supplement or switch to infant formula during the first year. For this reason, assuring the quality of infant formula is very important to manufacturers as well as millions of parents, caregivers, and infants. Infant formula is one of the most highly regulated foods in the world because it may be fed as a sole source of nutrition at a critical time of infant growth and development. This makes quality a key factor for regulatory oversight. U.S. infant formulas are manufactured with high-quality ingredients and with strict adherence to the U.S. Infant Formula Act and to FDA's good manufacturing practices. All infant formulas are required by law to include a use-by date on the container, which ensures that throughout the product's shelf life, it provides the 30 essential nutrients listed on the label. Infant formula fed past the use-by date may not deliver all the nutrients at the exact levels that are listed on the label because some of the nutrients degrade over time. Thus, the use-by date is primarily an indicator of product quality, not safety. By contrast, the term adulterated, as defined by FDA, generally means a product that's harmful or injurious to human health because it contains a poisonous or deleterious substance. And although the definition, definition of adulterated includes specific infant formula provisions, they refer to manufacturer activities rather than retailers. Accordingly, calling an infant formula that is passed its use-by date adulterated would be inconsistent with existing definitions in the law and would not address the issue of concern that is selling expired formula. Therefore, INCA suggests alternative language that would instead more clearly prohibit the retail sale of infant formula past its use-by date. Indeed, Congress took a similar approach in 2011 with the passage of the Food Safety Modernization Act when it implemented preventive controls and created a new prohibit prohibited act. We suggest the Infant Formula Protection Act of 2019 be implemented in a similar manner. INCA and its member companies consistently work with stakeholders to ensure infant formula is safe and nutritious. 
INCA meets regularly with the FDA's Office of Nutrition and Food Labeling to share information on infant feeding issues of mutual importance. INCA is working with the retail industry to develop a joint resource guide outlining best practices for handling infant formula returns and ensuring returned or expired product is never reshelved. INCA is also engaged with USDA regarding strengthening recommendations that state WIC agencies do not accept expired or returned infant formula or allow it to be given to area food banks or distributed through any other channels due to potential safety and quality concerns. In summary, INCA supports the intent of the Infant Formula Protection Act of 2019, but believes the best way to accomplish the goal of legislative, legislatively precluding the retail sale of expired infant formula is to amend Section 301 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Failure to abide by this restriction would constitute a prohibited act. We believe this would be the most effective way of supporting the collective goal of establishing statutory measures that ensure formula-fed infants receive safe, nutritious products while continuing to reassure parents and caregivers about the high quality of that formula. INCA and its members look forward to working with the bill sponsor, the committee, and all interested stakeholders to determine a workable solution to this issue. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony and that of all of the witnesses. Uh, I think you've all uh, done a uh, superb job. Uh, so now we've concluded your opening statements. We're going to move to member questions now, and um, I'll uh, recognize myself for five minutes uh, kicking that off. Uh, the FDA regulates about 77% um, of the U.S. food supply. That's a lot, 77%. Uh, this includes, and this was mentioned earlier, I don't know, by testimony or maybe one of the uh, opening statements of a, of a member, uh, that it includes everything we eat except uh, meat, poultry, and some egg products. Um, I'm concerned that the FDA may not have the, uh, the adequate staff and the resources uh, uh, to carry out, uh, it has uh, extraordinary responsibilities. Uh, but there's also, uh, just as there is here, uh, political will. Uh, I, I think sometimes that may be missing at the FDA as well, uh, uh, to make the hard choices about food regulation and safety, because they are controversial. I mean, we hear the differences right here on the uh, panel. Uh, but very importantly, it shows up in delays in FDA regulatory uh, or enforcement action. And um, I think that's where we come in on this. So uh, let me start uh, uh, with, um, you can just answer this really very quickly, uh, starting with Ms. Day. How long have you been waiting for the FDA to take uh, action on sesame allergen labeling? Um, you know, it's, it's never been done. I don't know. How old is your son now? My son is 10 years old. Oh, well, okay. Well, and you gave the example of when he was three. Yes. Okay. That's, and I will that say, I'd something. like to add in mm -hmm. that sesame is labeled in Canada, in the European Union, mm -hmm. in many places in Asia already. Mm -hmm. So America is behind. Yeah, I'm, I'm on this. I called over to the FDA and spoke to the lovely person that heads up the division or the department on this to see if it was better if we just get this done administratively or should we go the legislative route. Administratively, it was going to take five to seven years. Five to seven years. I mean, I, you know, it's, that's a long time. So um, uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, Ms. Uh, Benish, how long has the Environmental Working Group been petitioning the FDA on uh, the issue of PFAS con uh, contamination in food? Um, Environmental Working Group has been working on PFAS chemicals for 20 years now, and the first uh, action that we took on food packaging was in 2003. But uh, petitioning the FDA? Um, we have only, we were part of the, uh, the NGO petition that was filed in 2015, but we have been raising concerns about this issue for the last 15 years. Okay, so it's been a long time. Uh, Ms. Sorcher, how long have you been waiting for the FDA to define, uh, to define natural in uh, food products? Uh, I, I, I'd say it's been a while, yeah. Well, what does that mean, though? 
because um, we need that for the testimony for the record. Yeah, uh, so F FDA um, has uh, had this issue in its unified agenda for some time. Um, I, have I think to, in your testimony you said four years? Uh, so we've been waiting on sesame labeling since 2014. Dr. Palmer, how long have you been petitioning the FDA uh, to make a decision on the use of dairy to describe certain uh, foods? We submitted our first complaint to FDA on this subject in 1979. Holy moly. And I remember 1979, so I've been around for a while. <laughs> uh, Ms. Sorcher, um, should the FDA uh, this, is a, this is a broad question, but it's something that um, I have thought for many years, and going back to uh, uh, when Senator Kennedy was still with us, uh, we did legislation, myself in the House, he obviously in the Senate, uh, to make the FDA an independent agency uh, with a, um, uh, a, um, a six-year a six-year term for a commissioner. So there wouldn't be any um, political entanglements uh, with the agency, and, um, and we can see from your testimony there, there, there are really some split decisions between FDA uh, and other agencies. Do you have a view on that, both uh, Ms. Sorcher and Ms. Uh, Benish? If you don't, it's okay. <laughs> uh, you look floored by my comment, but. Particularly about the. Uh, about the FDA, rate. about FDA. As public health advocates, do you think that um, if the FDA were an independent agency, that that would, um, uh, A, that it would be able to make uh, 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 decisions that were more timely uh, uh, on any of the issues that are before us at the table? We have two, four, six, eight witnesses. We think what's clear is that uh, FDA has been slow to act on this particular issue, um, and Got it. one of many organizations that's Anyone else? by that. Anyone else have? My time has expired. So, did, did you want to? Does anyone else want to comment? I'd say it, it's very important for FDA to be able to preserve that independence. Um, I, I don't know if I can comment on the particular legislation. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, my time has expired. Um, I'm pleased to call on, and it's not Dr. Burgess. Burgess. It's Mr. Shimkus from the state of Illinois, recognized for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Dr. DeLeo, anyone else a scientist on this panel? So I, timing is an interesting thing, I, I, you know, and I'm on the, um, on the, uh, the toxic chemical committee, um, the scientific process just going through the deliberations of how long it takes to prove something is safe or not. Dr. DeLeo, how, how, just how long does it take for a scientific process to go through the multiple, multiple generations, would you say? Um, <clears throat> with regard to uh, th this issue, uh, it's an activity that the agency, FDA, can do in a matter of months. Um, now the issue becomes if there are questions and new data, um, what happens then? And, and there is time. Con there are time constraints around the food contact notification process, where the agency can stop the clock and get the data. It well, let, let, let me let me go in this route then. Uh, per and polyfluorinated compounds, commonly known as PFAS, uh, there's a list about 7,866, at least through the EPA, um, to make things. So that's a lot. Uh, so uh, I have my total always my concern is throwing the all 7,866 under a, 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 a bright line of this is bad and it's, and it's really doing great damage to our society is, is, is not fair, nor is it correct without doing the due diligence of the scientific community. It's, it's easy for us emotionally mm -hmm. to do this, um, but it's not scientific in the application. So uh, you, we can briefly break up the 7,866 into long chain and short chain. Uh, and you, I think in this world of packaging, you mentioned 100 mm -hmm. of the 7,866 right. that, that are commonly uh, used. In the US, uh, 
are older, long-chain fluorinated chemistries such as PFOA and PFOS um, still used for grease-resistant and moisture coatings on food packaging? Uh, it's my understanding that they are no longer used. And that, for my colleagues, those two were the real big debate in the, in the bill that went to the floor. Mm -hmm. um, following up on that question, is there specific short-chain PFOS chemistry currently used in food packaging subject to careful review and approval by the FDA? Um, yes, they all would have been gone through the approval process at FDA. So that means careful review? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and approval? Correct. So well, part, part of the debate that we've had, too, on the other bill was that um, this stuff has been vetted by the FDA. Yes, and they have opportunities, again, to ask for more data, to stop the clock, um, to object if they don't uh, believe in the safety of those applications. Do you have confidence that the FDA has highly dedicated and capable staff to conduct these evaluations and ensure the safety of food packaging and public health? Uh, yes, having worked with those staff personally, they're, they're excellent, well-trained, highly trained, uh, uh, national if not global experts in this area. Does FDA have sufficient staff resources to review complex chemistries such as per and polyfluorinated compounds? I believe they have the resources they need for the day-to-day -day, uh, review of applications. The question of, you know, a retrospective look at, you know, what's occurred, I, I don't know the extent to which that might require additional resources. That's probably something you'd want to check with the agency about. Should Congress circumvent FDA's expertise and authority to regulate PFAS chemistries in food packaging? I think FDA is the best uh, agency to, to regulate these chemistries in uh, food contact applications. So if this bill were the past, what would be the real world implications of, of this uh, ban? I think you would have a lot of disruption because you have a, a lot of uses and I think uh, the, the food industry that would be impacted wouldn't, wouldn't know about it and would suddenly be faced with the question of do I have something to replace it. Um, as was discussed previ previously, uh, Washington State is implementing a ban on food, uh, PFAS and food packaging, but that only goes into place if there are alternatives in, available. Um, so that question of is there an alternative available for what would be banned is not considered in, in this legislation and you could have broad reaching Im implications. We have you know, uh, folks from the, the dairy industry here who could, who could be impacted and, and much of the other uh, uh, industries in the, in, the, in the food supply. Yeah, and so I think the other concern is what do they replace it with and going right. through the vetting process and, and the like. Um, this, this fight will continue um, and I would just end on um, we need to do the scientific process. We don't need to move and regulate based upon emotion, but let science lead the debate and discussion and then move forward. So with that, I, I thank you for your time and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Matsui, for her five minutes of question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Day, welcome to the Energy and Commerce Committee and thank you for sharing your personal story on parenting a child with life-threatening food allergies, I can relate to this, um, I, your story about Zachary and camp, and I have a grandson who has a peanut and nut tree allergy, and he's begging to go to camp, and finally this year we are gonna let him do that, but what you said about talking to the camp counselors and packing an encyclopedia of do's and don'ts and packing the EpiPens, that's what we're facing, so this is a real thing that we have to deal with every single day, and I applaud you for coming here today. And I also want to thank the Center for Science and the Public Interest for supporting my bill, the FASTER Act. We know that 32 million Americans have food allergies, including one out of every 13 children. Their daily lives centered around avoiding certain, f certain foods and taking precautions against accidental exposure to allergens. Given the dramatic increase in the prevalence and severity of food allergies over the past few decades, it is likely that many people in this room have a friend or a family member impacted by food allergies. I myself have a crab and lobster allergy, which I guess is crustacean shellfish. In order to advance treatment and improve the lives of people with food allergies, we must do more to recognize and study food allergies as a public health issue. That's why I've introduced the FASTER Act, legislation that updates allergen labeling laws, increases research, expands patient experience data to include food allergies, and studies the economic cost of food allergies. By improving the ways in which we monitor and manage these complex and multifaceted diseases, we can better understand, treat, and maybe one day prevent food allergies. I want to spend some time talking about sesame, 
as the FASTER Act has a provision requiring that foods containing sesame disclose this ingredient on the food label. When discussing my bill, I often find there's some confusion around food manufacturers, around whether food manufacturers must list all their ingredients on labels. Ms. Socher, under current law, what major food allergens must be disclosed on food labels? So currently the eight um, most prevalent allergens have to be disclosed on uh, food labels, and sesame is number nine, so it's not required to be disclosed. Number nine, okay. And it's, it's clear that the FDA can act on its own to update the list of major allergens. Why do we need legislation to achieve this goal? So we have urged FDA to update the list, and as I said, we submitted a petition in 2014, um, and we've just been waiting a very long time. Uh, there, what they, they did open a, a docket in 2018, received comments. They have more than adequate data to make this decision, and it's just been delay, delay, delay. Okay. Ms. Day, without an explicit requirement, in some cases, sesame is listed in nonspecific terms like tahini and spices, correct? Correct, yes. Uh, okay, then tell me, how do you manage to avoid exposing Zachary to sesame when it isn't labeled? Um, so I will say it is quite difficult. The onus is very much on the caretaker, the parent, to read every label, which already takes a lot of time and resources. Um, and then when you also need to look for terms like spices, natural flavors, after, when you see that, you know it can be hidden, and so you have to then call the company and right. see if they will tell you if sesame is included in, what, in that term. Right. So right. there are often products out there that I imagine he could eat if it were labeled, but I can't give to him and take that chance. Oh, exactly. I read labels all the time, and it's just endless. It's terrible, and they're very small, too. Yes. Um, <laughs> You also mentioned the number of hospitalizations for food allergies has increased by 400% in the last decade. A 400% jump is an astounding, astounding increase and is certainly a public health problem, especially when we're talking about the kinds of very serious, life-threatening reactions many children are experiencing. Um, do we know why we're seeing such a rapid increase? So the answer is we don't. Okay. Um, we, I wish we knew. Mm -hmm. um, all we can say is we, there's we need proof more research. that there is yeah. this rapid increase. Uh -huh. The reason why still needs more research. Right. So that's what this bill is all about, too, increasing the research so that we can understand why we have the allergens, what people react to, it, and all that nature, too. But in the meantime, you know, the only way that we can actually avoid this is really know what's in the food that we have. So that's why Correct. this labeling is so important. Um, I have had experience of re reading these labels, and I have to read them twice, and then I also have to call, too. I mean, we're very much concerned about, especially with Robbie going to camp, and you never know because you had an accidental type um, situation there, too. So anyway, um, this is something that people really have read about and have to understand when you have a family member or a friend who's exposed to some sort of allergen, it is serious. So anyway, I, I uh, yield back. Thank you. Yeah, thank the gentlewoman, and um, thank you for your important work on this legislation. Pleasure to recognize uh, the patient, Dr. Bouchon, uh, from Illinois for his five minutes of questions. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I'm intrigued by this hearing because it's, you know, if the American public are listening, I don't think there's anything safe left in food in America. It's just uh, striking. Um, a couple of <laughs> couple of questions, uh, Ms. Mountford. You stated that the use date is an indicator of product quality, not safety. So infant formula consumed past the use date is not unsafe? No. It just doesn't provide the nutrients that are... At the level that they're listed on the label, correct. Correct. So... Uh, what are the health implications potentially of using it after the use date then? I mean, other than <laughs> well, the specific things that are in, in there, there's no negative health implication per se of, of using it. It's just there's a negative health implication because you're not getting the nutrients there. That, That's correct. Yeah, and okay. not getting the nutrients like for one day would, would – Obviously not Probably not problem. do anything. You'd have to not get the nutrients for a long time. So. Right. So the term adulterated could 
could be misleading. That was your Absolutely. testimony. Because reading about what that means, that means it wasn't even de processed or developed in the based on the criteria that would that would be safe potentially. Adulterated means that it has something harmful in it. Poison. There's potential that so adulterated would mean that that there actually is a safety concern, not Absolutely. a quality concern, right? So yes. I think that was kind of my concern with what we're maybe putting that language in in the way it's described. Um, I'm interested in the, in the milk situation, uh, Mr. Balmer. I mean, my, I have children who are in their 20s and they drink, um, you know, um, almond milk, milk, so to speak, and all that. And we've had actually had this conversation in my house household and asked them to actually look at what's labeled on the product. And honestly, just personally, I, I, I do have a problem labeling things incorrectly, just not just this, but anything. Because because fundamentally, I think it's it's a marketing deceptive marketing practice to to grab market share, which is uh, and so in general, as a member of Congress, anything that companies, no matter what industry they're in, that purposefully deceptively try to gain market share by mislabeling things is an issue. And I guess I I. I'm tr struggling to find out why you said 1979 you voiced this complaint. Why the FDA, in this particular instance, has refused to do it? Are there, are is the industry out there that is producing these? And honestly, I, some of it probably is going to be uh, cultural and social pressure right now, not to change, not to enforce it. I would say. I mean, what? Why do you think the FDA is not doing anything when it's pretty clear that? That, and I'm not criticizing the other companies. I'm just saying, in general, I don't like it when people try to market uh, things uh, to people when they know they they know that it's a marketing tool and not not really has has no f and the product's not labeled properly. Oh, Why is the FDA not doing anything about it? We we appreciate uh, your comments and obviously would concur. For years, we were told by FDA that it wasn't a priority because. Uh, it, it was a labeling issue, and it wasn't a pu of public health concern, and their first order of business is always public health, maybe as it should be. Uh, but we've experienced now this growth of these imitation dairy products not meeting nutritional equivalents. Right, so there are episodes yeah, now yeah. where there are um, uh, malnourished children out there because well-meaning parents are feeding the uh, substitute products and assuming because they carry the standardized dairy term that, um, uh, that they're being adequately nourished. So we believe now FDA should be aware that there is a public health concern and that this should be brought to the fore. And the Sounds kind of similar to the past date baby formula, right? Perhaps. I mean, because it's, you're assuming based on it saying milk that it has the same nutri nutritional value as milk as defined by, as defined, and that may not be true, so it's de it's deceptive and people may not be getting the, the product that they want. Yeah, I, I, I highlighted an yeah. a, a, a example of, uh, of the almond product having only yeah. uh, two grams of protein versus yeah. eight, that type of thing. Yeah. My, my objection to some of these things, like I said, I'm not criticizing the, any one specific company. We're seeing more and more and more of deceptive labeling, especially as it relates to genetically engineered food products and other things, to maintain market share, to get market share. It has nothing to do with nutrition and it has nothing to do with you're getting a better product. It's purely marketing and market share. And I think that as a society, you know, we need, uh, we need to be careful because um, it's, it's going to ultimately be found out that, that People have now a massive market share, and their product doesn't provide the, 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 what people are thinking it provides. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Um, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Trader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I'd like to just take a couple minutes to uh, talk about the CURT Act, which I'm a proud sponsor and feel uh, it's time to... Uh, uh, put to rest, uh, uh, you know, controversy has been around for a long, long time. Uh, 80 years, natural cheese has been used to distinguish from processed cheese. I think it's extremely important for the industry, the men and women that are, that are in the industry. Uh, it'll preserve the cheesemaker's ability to use the term natural cheese to help provide consistency for the consumer 
as they've had for decades. Uh, and I think that's really important, getting to the comments about uh, truth in, in labeling. Uh, and until the 2014 lawsuit, I was unaware that anyone viewed this as an issue. I've had zero comments at my office in D.C., my, my office back home in Oregon. Uh, so just wonder, you know, why uh, th they're trying to change things. Uh, we've had four rounds of technical assistance on this bill uh, with the FDA. Uh, they've indicated their opinion the passage of this bill would not lead to consumer confusion, as some people would have. Uh, the Senate actually passed this bill by unanimous consent. That does not happen every day in the United States Congress. Uh, so I think we should act on this bill and, and move forward. Uh, Mr. Balmer, switching gears to the, to the Pride Act a little bit, uh, it's my understanding that other countries uh, more consistently enforce dairy terms than we do. You alluded to uh, the butter issue in your, your uh, opening remarks. Could you expand a little bit, please? Sure. Um, you won't be able to see this graphic, but I have an illustration here of uh, three products, excuse me, the same product in three different containers sold in three different countries. So uh, other countries are doing a better job on, on enforcing uh, labeling provisions of their standards. Same product, uh, it's an almond-based uh, almond beverage product sold in the United States, sold in the United Kingdom, and sold in Canada. Sold under three different uh, name of the food um, uh, presentations. In um, uh, the United Kingdom, it's sold as a dairy-free milk alternative. Uh, in Canada, it's sold as a non-dairy beverage. We hear this complaint often. It's a necessity that we call this product uh, blank milk. Um, we beg to differ because we see it's successful marketing in other countries. Very good. Thank you. Switching gears to the, uh, uh, the horse bill, I, I, as an equine veterinarian for 30 plus years, uh, uh, appreciate the intent behind the bill, but I am a little concerned about the welfare of the horse itself in this country. Um, uh, there was some testimony about uh, horses being injected on a daily basis or fed things on a daily basis, medications and uh, that could be toxic to humans. Is that your experience, Dr. Corey? Well, I think that, that uh, for a, to be an equine veterinarian and you're going to take care of horses, you are going to inject, you know, some with, with different products over, you know, over the, the life of a horse. But, but as how, these many, how many do you do on a daily basis? I mean, I, I, there's one horse. The implication is that these horses uh, that you see or I see on a regular basis are out there daily uh, injecting them with medication or feeding them uh, pharmaceutical uh, products. Is that your experience? Well, I would, I would say that probably <laughs> that's a difficult question, not, not knowing the, the practice types you're in. But if you're in a busy practice, you know, most horses will probably end up with an injection of some sort uh, for something, uh, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that answer your question? Well, at some point in time, I totally agree. Oh, yeah. There are withdrawal periods. I know that we have those in our livestock industry, and uh, you testified that uh, the Mexico, Canada, the EU also have withdrawal periods uh, that they require uh, before an animal is allowed for <coughs> consumption. Yeah. Canada and, and Mexico have this six-month withdrawal, and uh, any of the any of the meat that go Canada has a zero tolerance, and once this meat is processed after six months or more, uh, these horses have been in a in a large area. Um, their their testing, a rigorous testing, is done for um, drug residues, and uh, I think anything any any meat that has horse meat that's been found to have drug residues then it's, it's, uh, it's tossed, it's uh, thrown out. So I think they're very serious about it. Um, I think we have the same you know, standards here in this country, you yeah. know, uh, with cattle, sheep, hogs, pigs, mm -hmm. chicken, you know, we withdraw so. so I, I guess I'm just concerned that, uh, you know, the idea that uh, the medications are all dark and evil and meant to contaminate the food supply is wrong. They're for, done for the health of the horse in necessary situations. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's what we're, well, that's what veterinarians do every day. Right. Okay. Thank Can you. Can I respond, Dr. Schrader? Well, my time is expired. Okay. Gentlemen, um, yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the ranking member of our subcommittee, well, Dr. Burgess. First, okay. Our ranking pharmacist first. All right. We'll go to, as I said at the first panel, the only pharmacist in the Congress. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carter from Georgia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Did somebody want to respond to that last question? 
Yes, I was hoping to just add that there really are no safe residue levels or withdrawal periods per the FDA for phenylbutazone, which I'm sure you're familiar with butte for horses. It's a common pain relief analgesic. I, I give it to my three rescue horses on, on a regular basis when they're sore. And the FDA has been very clear that there is absolutely no appropriate use for a horse that's received butte in the food supply. I brought from my barn this morning Dermosidin gel, which is a, a sedative that I use for my mini horse because he's afraid of the veterinarian. Um, and it says, do not use in horses intended for human consumption. Ivermectin, a dewormer, regularly provided to horses, same label. So I think um, it, it's proper and, and we want horses to receive these drugs and treatments and therapies. In the summer, my horses are sprayed for flies every single day. So they are definitely not candidates for slaughter. And I think it's really important to realize that we know this already here in the U.S. per the FDA. So that's what we lean on is that expertise. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Enough horsing around. Let's um, <laughs> um, thank all of you for being here. This is extremely important. I wanted to ask you, Mrs. Monford, um, adulterated, and I'm following along the same lines as Dr. Bouchon's questioning, but um, it's defined by the, FDA, by the FDA to mean a product that's harmful or injurious to human health. And, you know, we all know how parents are, especially with the first or second child. Now, by the time you get to third or fourth, it doesn't matter. But the first or second, you're very, very careful. And, well, I mean, you're very, very careful, and we know how they are. How do you think that, um, or what are your concerns with parents reacting to this classification of uh, adulterated? I mean, is that going to, you think that could possibly lead them to, to, to switch to non-regulated alternatives? Well, it's a very frightening term, and I think if there were any concern uh, that something was adulterated, absolutely yes. They may turn to homemade formula, which obviously is of concern and is not recommended, or some other alternative. Well, what about um, the use of, of non-regulated formula alternatives that, um, that, that might be past the use-by date? Is that ever a concern? I'm sorry, could you... The, the non-regulated alternatives that, that are not adulterated, not labeled as that, but they're non-regulated. And, and if, they're used, if they're past their use-by date, is that a concern for, for people? I, I, it would probably depend on the product that you're talking about. Okay, and, okay. Well, let me ask you this. You mentioned in your testimony that you would um, support taking steps to, to ensure that expired inf infant formula wasn't being sold at retail. And I, I was surprised to learn that this was a problem, to be quite frankly with you. Is it that common? It, it isn't uh, extremely common. Um, Safety is a top priority, so of course we support any measures that could could eliminate this issue. It seems to occur often, not often, but sometimes in smaller um, stores, convenience stores, um, not, it, it's, it's less common in, in the bigger retail chains. It, whose responsibility is it? Is it the retailer to make retailer. sure that that doesn't happen or? Yes. Okay, are, are there any kind of fines or anything associated with that? Is it different state by state or what? It is the retailer's responsibility, and to be honest, I'm not sure state to right, state how it right. is. You know, it, it's hard to believe that that's happening in our current system. Um, you know, as a pharmacist, I know that we have an expiration date, and we certainly have the responsibility to make sure that we're not using a product past its expiration date. But in, in our case, a lot of times it's based on the efficacy of the product and, and not necessarily other things. So... This is this is different though. This is a use by date, not an expiration date. So use by again is a quality issue. Use by is a quality issue as opposed to an expiration date being. You should not use. You it. should not my, use it past this date. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that information, Madam Chair. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, for his five minutes <coughs> of questions. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
before I begin, I'd like to ask unanimous consent uh, to submit for the record two documents mm -hmm. from public health organizations. Uh, one is a consensus statement last fall from four public health groups, which notes that uh, plant-based beverages are not nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk and voices agreement with the Dietary Guidelines for America uh, that these products are generally not good substitutes for meeting recommendations for dairy, inta uh, uh, for dairy intake. And the second is a letter from the American Academy of Pediatrics, which notes that pediatricians have reported that using the term milk on imitation products has caused parental confusion and led to parents buying imitation products for their children under the mistaken belief that they contain similar nutritional components to real dairy. So with your permission. So ordered. Uh, and I'm glad to see the Dairy Pride Act is being considered. Uh, Mr. Schrader was just uh, speaking about that. And it's a big deal for our dairy farmers. And uh, some of the pushback comes from folks that say it's not really a big deal. But here's what just ought to be the rule. A label's a label. And uh, as Scott Gottlieb said uh, when he was still in that position, uh, if it's not from, uh, the, the, if it's not lactation, then a nut, a seed, uh, these other products that can be good or n do not meet the definition of a dairy product. So it's really just a simple question of having accuracy in labeling. Uh, and there were some folks who were pushing back saying there really isn't consumer confusion. Uh, we're not going to go out and test it, but why don't we have labeling accuracy? Uh, and uh, if we are, all we're asking the FDA to do in this bill, uh, Madam Chair, is to enforce the labeling rules that already exist. And uh, they may need a nudge with legislation saying that we need them to do their job. Uh, Mr. Bomber, I heard your statement and appreciate it, but um, I've heard some claims that the Dairy Pride Act in enforcing standards of identity somehow violates the First Amendment and interferes with marketing of other common foods. Do you want to take a shot at addressing those claims? Uh, likewise, Mr. Welsh, we've heard the, the, uh, the same issue being raised, and uh, uh, we're not in agreement. Um, there is uh, enforced government speech on food labels all the time. And... Uh, the uh, issue, for instance, of a nutrition, nutrition facts panel. It's required on, on every package. And uh, so we see that the, the government does have uh, the ability to impose certain labeling on uh, food products. So uh, we, would, we think there are uh, many um, examples uh, of okay. this. And uh, thank you. And can you elaborate on the so-called health halo effect of real milk? and why non-dairy alternative be beverages may want to associate themselves uh, with dairy milk? <laughs> yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, milk being the uh, source of uh, nine um, essential uh, nutrients and uh, obviously an attractive target to hitch one's uh, wagon to, if I can mix my metaphors there. Um, but, uh, you know, with the uh, uh, accepted knowledge of milk's importance in the nutrition of, of, of children and adults, um, it's, it's, it's very easy for right. marketers of imitation products to uh, glom on um, to that halo. Thank you very much. I hope we can move forward on this just so that we give integrity to whatever the label is. Uh, and I thank the panel uh, for your testimony on other matters as well, being from Vermont, dairy being under siege uh, and wanting to do everything we can for our farmers. I focused, obviously, on the Dairy Pride Act. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll yield back, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. The, the gentleman yields back uh, uh, with our gratitude for uh, uh, the important work that he's doing on this bill and so many other matters. Um, does the uh, rank, uh, uh, I want to recognize the ranking member Thank you, uh, Madam for Chair. your five minutes. Ms. Malford, I just uh, wanted to kind of close the loop on, on this issue that we've talked about on adulteration. <laughs> This committee, this subcommittee, heard extensive testimony back in 2007, 2008 on the issue of uh, melamine contaminating first pet food, and then fortunately not in this country, but melamine contaminating infant formula, melamine being the substance that basically countertops are made of. And if melamine is ground up and added to a product, 
it significantly increases the test, the qualitative test for nitrogen, and the inference is that, hey, the protein potency of this product is, is good. It's way up there. So pet food was affected in this country. I don't know, after talking to veterinarians in my district, after the revelation, uh, no one could give me figures, but there was uh, a significant increase of pets that were lost to kidney failure that was one of the consequences of, of ingesting this stuff. And then the, and Mr. Stupak's still here with us in the audience, he'll remember the reports coming out of China where there was Chinese infant formula that was contaminated with melamine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yes, it was a scandal, and the yeah. Chinese head of the Food and Drug Administration yeah. was dealt with very, very harshly. But yeah. it, uh, to me, that's adulterated <laughs> formula, not something that's passed its use-by date. So I appreciate your comments, and I appreciate your, your delineation of that. Uh, sure, if the folic acid content has diminished by the use-by date, we should be aware of that. Uh, but at the same time, it's not truly an adulterated product. We've seen adulterated products, and this is not that. Correct. And, and we, would, we would be happy, as I said, to support the intent of this bill because we certainly want good quality products out there, nutritious products, and, if, um, and this would help um, to, um, to avoid having products that are less nutritious sold. This, Madam Chair, this seems like it's uh, China's impact on the health of America Day. Uh, I've got a coronavirus hearing that I'm, I'm trying to get to. Uh, we just had on the floor the extension of the scheduling for fentanyl analogs that are coming into this country from China. And then, of course, I was reminded of the Chinese melamine issue. So, um, yeah, we can't be too careful. I'd like to yield the rest of my time to Mr. Griffith from Virginia, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Burgess. Dr. Corey, uh, domestic horse slaughter effectively ceased around 2007. Given Congress's prohibition on the use of federal funds to inspect horses intended for human consumption, what was the result of this de facto ban on domestic horse slaughter? Um, I think that, that uh, the GAO had a report out in 2011, um, let me. Well, time's a ticking. You can get that to us at yeah. a later date. That would be great. What was the, what's your recollection of what it's, it's actually is? highlighted as, okay. as action needed to address the unintended consequences of cessation of domestic slaughter. The bottom line is that, that there were a rise in investigations of horse neglect and more abandoned horses since 2007 and up, up more than 60% in Colorado and um, and California. So I think that that is what has happened. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is is that it actually had a negative impact on uh, the horse welfare. In negative, negative, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, given your experience in the field, how will H.R. 961 place additional burdens on efforts to rehome unwanted horses? Well, it's going to place burdens because we've got that many more horses to deal with and we just don't have the facilities. And, and I think we're going to see um, th these burdens via our state, local uh, municipalities having to deal with these horses that, that owners can't take care of. They don't have the funds to take care of them. So, yes. And, and in fact, in our area where they don't really, I live in southwest Virginia, so it's not really marked, doesn't make sense to market them north or south. We're just kind of in the middle. And what happened in the past, it hasn't happened recently, but y you had to lock up your, your fields and your horse or your cattle uh, haulers when you went to market because you'd come back after selling your cows and find somebody had left you some unwanted horses and <laughs> then you had to deal with them either in your field or otherwise. So people were not worried about horse thieves, they were worried about people Dumping horses. And well, that's well, actually, in the West, we found that to be true, and I've talked to several state veterinarians that have indicated that horses were abandoned and turned out in the um, out in the wild with the wild roaming horses, and that's a fact. Yeah. All right. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You back? Could I comment on that? Do you have time? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's a little over time, but go ahead. I just wanted to mention that the only science that tries to make any correlation between abandonment and neglect of horses can tie it to, to economic downturns. And in 2007, when GAO 
based its conclusion on purely anecdotal information, no data whatsoever. We've since then seen economists come out tying that to the economic downturn and not at all to the cessation of slaughter. And I think the data today would bear that out. Unfortunately, no state actually accurately tracks equine neglect or abandonment. We don't have that kind of data to help us see. But we are data driven on this issue and, and it does matter. I really appreciate your question. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Did you say th that the GAO gave anecdotal information? Was it a survey? No. They, the they, first time I've ever heard anyone say GAO has given anecdotal I know, it was, information. It was, it was an anomaly, and w they had a lot of good data in that report, but they did receive information from state vets who reported horses being abandoned and neglected. And our, our sense in looking back at that and economics um, experts who've looked back at that say it was tied to the recession, which started exactly at the same time that the domestic ban on horse okay. slaughter. Thank you. I appreciate we it. We continue to say right. that. Uh, I'd now like to uh, recognize the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Dingle. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, in my bill, the Keep Food Containers Safe from PFAS Act, is one of the bills that we are uh, considering or having hearings on today. With the passage of the PF, with the PFAS Action Act earlier this month, the committee has taken big strides needed to kickstart the cleanup of legacy PFAS contamination, limit discharges of PFAS waste into air and water, help community water systems upgrade their infrastructure to filter out PFAS, and much more, though we need the Senate to act for it to really happen. However, one of the more troublesome exposures to PFAS that often goes unnoticed is the use of these chemicals in food packaging. Last year, Congress took an important first step in the NDAA bill to ban the use of PFAS in food packaging for MREs. My bill, the Keep Food Containers Safe from PFAS Act, would build on this success to provide FDA to deem PFAS substances in any food containers or cookware unsafe. So I'm going to direct these questions to uh, Ms. Benesh. But Ms. Benesh, what do we know about the health effects of PFAS in food packaging? Does FDA have a safety threshold for PFAS that it uses to calculate how much PFAS in food is safe? Um, so we do know that PFAS migrates from food packaging into food. Um, and we know that some of the health effects broadly associated with PFAS chemicals include some kinds of cancers, um, and then at much lower doses, reproductive harms, developmental harms, and reduced effectiveness of vaccine. Um, what's really concerning to me is FDA has said it is using EPA's reference dose for drinking water uh, for PFOA and PFOS, which are two of the uh, food packaging chemicals that are no longer being used. But for all the PFAS that are still in food packaging, um, they, they have not calculated a uh, reference dose, and so they're using the kinds of assumptions that they apply to other chemicals that don't operate in the body the same way that PFAS do. And so I'm a, I'm a bit at a loss of how FDA has uh, determined that these chemicals are safe without determining what their safety threshold is first. So if Americans currently have concerns about PFAS, which I think they should, and food packaging, can they shop around this problem if they're looking in PFAS food packaging? Um, unfortunately not. Uh, unlike the ingredients in food that do have to be on the label or the ingredients in a cosmetic product that have to be on the label, uh, there's no requirement that the ingredients in a food packaging material have to be on the label. So it's very difficult to avoid if consumers do want to shop around it. Has FDA ever withdrawn a food contact notification for PFAS chemical on its own? Um, no, only in response to industry abandonment, but never uh, on its own because of a health concern. Is that why we need Congress to do something? We do think that Congress needs to step in because FDA hasn't appreciated the urgency of this issue. Um, no one knows better than Michigan uh, how, how urgent this problem is um, and how overburdened many communities already are. You know, it's not just Michigan, though, just as you say that. We've tested for it. Flint Water taught us something. As other states start to test, they're going to be as bad as Michigan, which is what's so scary. And food isn't just marketed to Michigan. It's marketed in every state. Are industry safety data backing up new approvals of food contact substances made public by the FDA? 
they are only through the food contact notification system, which is the way that FDA has approved uh, food contact substances since 1997, you can only get that underlying scientific information through a public records request. It's not easy for the public to access. I'm going to ask you one more question because I'm going to run out of time. But I don't think people um, understand this. I want to put something to bed that often gets raised. If we designate PFAS as hazardous substances under CERCLA, which we need to do and haven't, or Superfund, would food companies no longer be allowed to use PFAS in food packaging? Um, thank you for the question, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. We couldn't agree more uh, that PFOA, PFOS, and other PFAS chemicals uh, urgently need to be designated as Superfund chemicals um, under our hazardous substances law, but Superfund is a cleanup law. It has no bearing on the use, uh, other uses of PFAS in commerce, and we have looked at this issue um, and found that 80% of the roughly 800 hazardous uh, substances under Superfund are still in commerce, and many of them can continue to be in very wide production. So the only way to ban PFAS in food packaging is to ban PFAS in food packaging, as you've proposed. Which is why we need the bill, and it's in the blood for everybody here of 99% of the people in this country, and they don't know it. Thank you very much, and I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. Uh, and now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Day. I know that it's a, a struggle. Um, and my question to you is, you have three children, all of whom have severe allergies, if I remember your testimony correctly. <laughs> Do they have the same allergies? Uh, <laughs> um, unfortunately, no. <laughs> There are some overlaps, but I, I mean, if I told you, my oldest daughter is allergic to tree nuts. Uh -huh. My middle is allergic to dairy, eggs, sesame, mustard, and fish. Mm -hmm. And my youngest is allergic to peanuts, eggs, flax seeds, sesame, and mustard. Yeah. Uh, I come from an allergy family. We don't have the same allergies, thus the question. So my wife has to make three sets of, of a number of foods that we eat. Uh, if we order pizza... Uh, even if it's just me and the two boys, we get three pizzas because each one of us has a different dietary concern. Yeah. So that raises a question where I think we can get the language straightened out, and I don't think you would object to it. In the bill, it talks about doing a study, and one of the studies, it says, study the economic cost of food allergies in the United States, both individually and the food allergy population. And the problem is every family is going to be different. I don't know how you study it individually without having 100,000 different studies so I think we need to tighten that language up. You would not have any problem with tightening that language up and looking at the costs overall. And maybe it means medical costs, but when you're looking at the cost of food, everything costs more when you have food allergies, doesn't it? Yeah. Because you're doing three or four types of the same thing, and the ingredients cost more sometimes, or most of the time. Um, so uh, that is certainly an issue in my family, and it sounds like in your family. Yes, ma'am. Um, sesame, though, has come to the top of the list. Absolutely. We already we absolutely in favor of that. I'm just talking about the study where it talks about the economic cost of food allergies, and I just don't know how you do that individually without studying hundreds of thousands of different scenarios. So I'm not a research expert okay. in that, so I can't... We'll work on that. Uh <laughs> All right. Slightly shifting gears, Ms. Benish. Um, at one time, and I haven't had this issue lately, but they had boiling bags, mm -hmm. and I would have a reaction to foods that were that were processed or boiled in a boiling bag. Is that PFAS or is that something else? Um, PFAS chemicals are usually uh, typically used as anti-grease proofing agents. So uh -huh. in uh, pizza boxes, sandwich wrappers, or so probably not. Line, a popcorn <laughs> bag. Um, it's, it's possible uh, that they have been used in, in plastic bag linings, but I'm not aware of that particular use. And, and I'm, I'm trying to get to the, to the facts and figure this stuff out. So Dr. DeLeo, and, and I don't, and we may end up with a little spat going here, and that's okay. I want to get the, get the information. And Ms. Benish, polymeric PFAS versus non-polymeric polymeric PFAS. Um, explain that, and why is it scientifically different, and is there some way, that, is there a need to distinguish between the two, or Ms. Benish, do you see them as being identical, where Dr. DeLeo in his testimony indicated that there's differences? Um, 
Well, there are lots of different uses of PFAS, and the use in PFAS typically... Well, I think he was talking about different types of PFASs. Yeah, so one use of PFAS uh, is to create these long polymers that are then applied to food packaging. The real concern is that, uh, particularly if you apply a hot food, um, those long polymers can then break down, um, and then the PFAS chemical uh, gets into the body, is my lawyer's understanding of the science. Okay. I understand. Dr. DeLeo, you want to respond? So uh, PFAS as a chemistry, as was mentioned, is thousands of chemicals, and they're very diverse. There are some that are hazardous, and there are some that are not hazardous. There are polymers, there are non-polymers. Um, HR 2027 is a pretty blunt instrument, look, taking a broad brush at all pol uh, PFAS chemistries, and I think that's, um, that's not a good way to, to approach uh, policy, and so I think uh, you really need to look at all the, the differences uh, in applications um, of these chemicals rather than painting everything with a, the same broad brush. I appreciate that. Ms. Perry, Dr. Corey, you, you all are obviously on opposite sides of the horse issue. Uh, both of you have raised good points. I, I did think it was interesting, Dr. Corey, you mentioned retirement homes for horses. Uh, that's a term I've often used. We're spending, uh, we're spending more than $80 million a year on retirement homes for horses. There are not enough families out there who want to adopt or enough facilities that want to adopt horses, which is why we have approximately 50,000 horses uh, from uh, federal lands that are now in what I call retirement homes. Um, is that fairly accurate according to the information that you have as well? I think the retirement, the rehoming is, we're doing a good job. Well, I'm we're, talking about putting them on farms where we're paying to subsidize oh. their their life after they've been removed from federal lands because there are too many of them on oh. federal lands. Oh, you're referring to the, the wild horse and burrow. I am. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a whole other issue. So we've got, we've got 100,000 horses there, and now with this legislation, we're going to create another additional potential 80 to 100,000 horses. Right. My and time is up. At, I would love to discuss this further, but my time is up. And I, I would also. <laughs> Me too. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I'm more accustomed in the uh, health subcommittee to talking about uh, uh, nursing homes, um, uh, convalescent homes when it comes to uh, the people in our country. So now it, it's very interesting to me to hear these uh, the same words used being applied to uh, horses. So thank you. Keep learning. Uh, I don't think there's anyone left except... Uh, Ms. Uh, Schakowsky uh, is waving on, and uh, or Mr. Long, um, Thank you, the Madam gentleman Madam. from uh, uh, Missouri, Mr. Long, Thank who, uh, in addition to his legislative skills, is a great, great auctioneer. In case anyone, <laughs> maybe some of these people that have the horses can make use of his uh, his talents. You're recognized. I for thought five you were going to say poodle wrangler, since I broke my shoulder before Christmas wrangling my daughter's <laughs> five-month-old poodle. But. That didn't work out too well. Uh, Mr. Carlin, we have heard several examples showing that the term natural cheese has a long history. The term even appears in the FDA regulations, as you know. Shouldn't cheese products be permitted to be labeled with a term that has been in use for more than 70 years? Yes. Can you speak to why there is a need to define natural cheese in statute and why this is different than changing the FDA's policy on the use of natural or all natural for product claims. Yes, um, as you know, uh, processed cheese is reflected in the current standards of identity, but for whatever reason, natural cheese has never been officially defined. Um, as we, uh, as we, as FDA looks at the term natural, uh, since uh, 1992, by the way, is when they started looking at how a product claim with natural would be defined. Um, there was a, uh, FDA has said uh, that, that that's something they're gonna try to do, but it's obviously been pending for quite some time. This legislation would not affect the uh, cheesemaker's ability to use the term uh, natural for product claim purposes. They would have to continue to comply with FDA's rules and regulations on that front. So this just provides consumers with information in the grocery store that they already have and they've had for a long time. It doesn't create anything new. It just preserves the ability to use that label going forward. You say in your testimony that the FDA, tech, FDA's technical experts have reviewed the bill extensively. Can you elaborate on the FDA's input? 
Yeah, so over the past two years, we've had three rounds of technical assistance uh, from FDA. We've also consulted with them informally, as had the bill's sponsors uh, on other occasions. Uh, they helped us uh, define the term natural cheese in a more enforceable way from their standpoint, uh, referencing the International Codex standard, for example. They also made the suggestion that we particularly call out in the bill that natural claims, uh, natural product claims, uh, would not be covered by this legislation to make it very clear so that, uh, that there would be no misunderstanding. This is just a, a simple label for natural cheese, those two words in quotes, nothing else about uh, all natural or 100% natural. So that was another FDA uh, suggestion. Yeah, okay. And there's also a question of whether or not the CURD Act will create confusion between the FDA and the USDA regarding the use of natural claims on labels. Can you talk about whether there will be inconsistencies between the FDA and the USDA on this? Well, as I said in my testimony, Congressman, uh, the only definition of natural that's relevant here is the FDA definition, because that's the only definition that applies to cheese. So the USDA has used the term natural cheese, just as FDA has for many, many decades, to talk about a category of cheese. That won't change, and that's perfectly consistent across uh, these two agencies. Okay, and I'm going to move down the line to Mr. Balmer. Uh, a question for you. I've heard claims that the Dairy Pride Act would somehow disrupt the consumer market. It seems to me that clear, transparent labeling actually should help the market by making sure shoppers have accurate information about products on the shelves. What's your take? Well, we're not quite uh, of a, the opinion that this would be disruptive to the marketing of these uh, imitation products because, as I uh, showed a little while ago, we have the same product produced in the same plant called by three different names in three different countries. Only in the United States is the term milk involved. In Canada, a different term. In the UK, a different term. So we don't see how uh, this legislation, which simply is asking for FDA to do its job and enforce what's on the books now, uh, we don't see how it would interfere with uh, continued growth in that category. And we have no problem as long as those products are labeled correctly. Okay. Thank you. And thank you all for being here today. And I will go on the Good record up. as saying when I go to the uh, Capitol Hill Club over here across the street, I walk in. You know, everybody knows what everybody's favorite drink is. And as soon as I walk in, they always put down a big glass of milk for me. And everyone laughs at me. But uh, I've done that my whole life. I yield back. Could I clarify a point on the Curt Act? Um, the, it, it, there, there's nothing that would... You, you can proceed. Go ahead. Uh, were the FDA to define natural, there would be nothing stopping a company from putting natural cheese on their product, provided they also met the FDA requirement, which would likely include no artificial ingredients. And I think even though cheesemakers have used this term for many years as a term of art, what goes on the label has to make sense to consumers as well. And we don't distinguish between a product name and a claim. Thank you very much. The gentleman uh, sealed it back. Uh, on milk, I think that uh, uh, there are two things that the senators are allowed uh, to have as a trial is taking place. One is water. The other, Mr. Balmer, is milk. How's that? I just hope it's not warm milk because it'll put them all to sleep. Um, they don't need that. Yeah, they don't need that. They can do that <laughs> naturally. Uh, a pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you uh, not only for letting me wave on to this uh, subcommittee, but also for including my legislation in there, which is um, the SAFE Act, um, Safeguarding Americans, Americans' Food Supply, uh, uh, <laughs> Food Exports, um, and um, it now has 224 co-sponsors. Uh, I also want to thank Nancy Perry from the ASPCA for being here to testify in favor of this legislation. So the Food and Drug Administration is responsible for protecting um, public health um, through uh, protecting our food supply. And I think it's doing generally, working very hard, but horse meat has definitely fallen through the, uh, the, 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 cr the cracks. Um, we know that uh, my bill addresses the danger of consuming horse meat. So I want to talk not just about uh, nursing homes or whatever for, for horses, but I want to talk about the dangers of uh, the um, allowing um, prohibited 
ingredients mm -hmm. to um, be in the, the, the horse meat um, that is still um, not prohibited for meat for eating in the United States of America. <laughs> Um, so we know also that horses are legally being exported for the purpose of slaughter for consumption. Kill buyers purchase these uh, horses at auction, ship them mostly to Canada and Mexico to be slaughtered for food. And even Ferdinand, the winner of the 1986 Kentucky Derby, fell victim to the horse slaughter industry. Um, the um, consumption of horse meat poses a grave threat to public health. Um, horses are routinely treated with uh, phenylbutate uh, uh, and other extremely potent bands and, uh, uh, products that are banned. Um, and, and so, Ms. Perry, has the FDA ban the use of these drugs in animals that we eat? Yes, they have. There is no legal use of phenylbutazone, and many yeah. of the hundred substances that we provided in our written testimony uh, for, uh, for uh, provision to food-producing animals. So there's no food use for most of those chemicals. And Ms. Perry, are there any animals, any equine, um, raised for food in the United States? They're not. They're not. Um, and can you explain why horse meat poses a food safety hazard? Well, I rely on the Food and Chemical Toxicology Journal peer-reviewed piece from Dr. Nick Dodman that, that was published in 2010 that reviews and tracks horses that were funneled into the slaughter pipeline from the U.S., and looks at the phenylbutazone content in their tissues after they were slaughtered. And that uh, article is, is frightening. It really demonstrates that those residues are there. Um, again, legally, no level of residue is appropriate or legal or safe, and there's no phase-out period for, for that particular drug. And again, many of the more than 100 substances that we've provided to the committee. But that article, indicates and documents how the FDA determined the health impacts of just phenylbutazone alone. If we just look at that one drug, which is probably the one that's been under the microscope the most, most of this has flown directly under the radar because nobody even knows this is happening. It's such a shadowy industry. But I'll just list that aplastic anemia, leukopenia, agranulocytosis, thrombocytopenia are just some of the serious illnesses that can lead to death, they're, they're basically blood platelet and bone marrow immunity diseases. So these are the horses that are being um, purchased American and horse. exported for the purpose of being eaten. That's correct. Um, so um, could you please describe some circumstances for which the FDA has issued warnings sure. to take action against food products in the United States for violating FDA standards? I don't think it's common knowledge, but the FDA actually has a ready availability of this information on their website. You can look at their enforcement records, and we've been stunned to see the number of times they've taken action when phenylbutazone has been given to food-producing animals. And let me, often let, let, me let me just, because uh, sure. my time is running out, mm. So what this legislation does, what the, fa uh, the, the SAFE Act would do, would um, explicitly ban consumption of horse meat in the United States and the import and export Correct. of horses um, and, equine, um, and equine parts. I think it's really important that we take action and that the FDA finally enter the picture to protect our food supply and that of what we're exporting. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlewoman yields back. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, each one of you. Uh, you've spent a long time here today, uh, and we appreciate it. Uh, but we also appreciate the knowledge that you've shared with us, firsthand knowledge. Ms. Day, about your children, and, uh, uh, and each one of you on the uh, bills that were part of this uh, uh, discussion uh, and, and your comments. Uh, on the uh, on the bills that uh, deal with uh, uh, with food and 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 FDA, uh, I want to thank. Uh, they're not in the room, but I want to acknowledge, uh, and I did earlier, but I, I want to acknowledge again 
the authors of the legislation uh, for the work that they've done. A lot goes into bills before they ever come into this room and uh, have expert uh, witnesses uh, come in and comment on it, uh, which is a very important part of our process. But uh, I think we took up how many bills today? Ten, Ten bills. And um, as long as I'm around, we're going to keep rolling on taking up as many bipartisan bills, bills that uh, uh, members sponsor and uh, have co-sponsorship, not only from this committee, but from uh, uh, outside the committee. I think it's an important thing to do. Uh, I don't think the American people really ask for that much. But these are all things that, um, uh, that they can't do for themselves. Uh, we're the ones that have to make the decision. So yeah, thank you Madam for Chair. everything that you've done to, um, uh, to assist us. Yes. I'm wondering um, if at this point I could ask to add into the record a letter from the AWA in favor of the- Certainly, AFA. so ordered. And uh, I'm uh, requesting unanimous consent uh, to enter into the record the following documents, a statement from Representative Meng in support of uh, her bill, H.R. 2267, a statement from the Consumer Federation, uh, Kids in Danger and Public Citizen in support of 2267, a letter from the United States Harness Racing Alumni Association in support of 961, a letter from Animal Protection of New Mexico in support of 961, uh, the testimony of Hillary Wood, president of the Front Range, uh, Front Range Equine Rescue, in support of 961. A letter from the Plant-Based Food, <laughs> Plant-Based Food Association opposing uh, 1769. A statement from the American Forest and Paper Association opposing HR 2827. A letter from the American Pharmacists Association. Where's Mr. Carter? Well, I'll have to tell him. Uh, in support of 5663, a letter from Return to Freedom in support of 961, letter from the Professional Rodeo, uh, a Cowboys Association opposing 961, a letter from, isn't it marvelous all the associations and organizations we have in the United States of America? It never ceases to amaze me. A letter from Diane Dorman in support of 4712, a letter from the Humane Society, uh, of the United States and the Humane Society Legislative Fund in support of 961, a letter from the Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association in support of 961, a letter from five lock livestock groups opposing 961, a letter from the National Black Farmers Association in support of 961, a letter from RCAF, C-A-L-F, opposing 961, a one-pager on 961 developed by Protect the Harvest Action Fund, letter from the Texas State Horse Council in support of 961, a letter to Vice President Pence from the United States Cattlemen's Association opposing 961. They could write to us too. A letter from the American Chemistry Council opposing 2827, a letter from Floro Council opposing 2827, a letter from the Animal Welfare Institute in support of 961, a statement from the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, uh, but it doesn't say whether they oppose or support, but it's a statement, so we'll have to read it. A statement from 15 healthcare organizations in support of 5668, a letter from the Jockey Club in support of H.R. 961. I doubt that's the restaurant, though. Do you? I, I don't think so. So uh, without objection? No objection. Uh, so ordered. Uh, so at this time, the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. I don't know if they need to correct that.